Good afternoon. I think sir is also online. Sir, you can unmute yourself. Audio is fine. Audio is also fine. Good. Uh, sir, we are having principal of uh, Alpi College, uh, Chandra Mauli, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome. Sir, we welcome you to the webinar, sir. Uh, we have the uh, two resource persons. Sir, um, principal, sir, kindly please uh, switch on your video, sir. Can you please start your video? Yes, sir. Uh, so, welcome, Hi, welcome, sir. A very good afternoon. Welcome, sir. So we have two resource persons. I am Satya Narayana from Chennai, and I am Akbar Shah from Trichy. So please un unmute yourself, sir. Principal, sir, kindly unmute yourself so that you can interact with the resource persons. Okay, sir. Welcome to all the resource persons. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, nice. Thank nice. you for your uh, our request. Thank you for our request accepting for conduct of our webinar. So very thankful to you, sir. All of your all resource persons are thankful, sir. Because yes. uh, the tribal area, the college is established in year 2011, sir. Uh, yes, as for sir. our department of uh, geology, very much uh, initiative for conduct of uh, webinars. Sir. Very good. Very so good. I, am also, I am also very much interested to conduct the webinars. Sir. Yeah. But our college is potential very less, sir. But anyhow, we will try our level, sir. Uh, uh, thank <laughs> you for, uh, for uh, accepting our uh, request. So kindly, I am very thankful to you. Thank you very much. No, they have done an excellent work. This is the first time I see along the initiation, the email by email. They put the uh -huh. initiation, right? And also the program schedule. Excellent. Excellent. And the do's and don'ts. <laughs> this is the first time I'm seeing the webinar on the other And uh, I'm really very glad about that. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much, sir. A very good afternoon and welcome to all participants. And the program will start sharp at 2, 2 p.m. And resource persons are also ready. Then join us at uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, now I am sharing you the program sheet already that is shared with you in your mail. Uh, just for quick reference, I am going to share the program sheet for you. The program will go as per the schedule given to you. Timings may change a little bit, but this is what we have planned. All the participants, thank you uh, for muting your mic. And when the program starts, when the webinar starts, and this is person start presenting, please stop your video also, so that you and others also will have a better video quality of the presenter. Mm -hmm. And the YouTube link is also open. If uh, your, when the room gets filled, please any of your friends uh, have any queries, ask them to click the YouTube link and uh, they can join directly and they can watch directly through the YouTube channel. Uh, any any queries, they can post there, even questions can be posted there, and they can post there and in the, chart, in the YouTube chat box, you will note it down and will present the, um, the questions to the resource person and they can hear the answers through the YouTube live also. Thank you. Please be patient. The meeting starts at 2 p.m. Party welcome to the webinar. Uh, may I request all the participants kindly uh, switch off your video so that we can have a better streaming quality other than the organizers and the resource persons may I request the other participants kindly 
switch off your video because the number of participants are increasing and we need to have a better streaming uh, principal government degree college arku uh, principal dr vs krishna government degree college kushakpatnam uh, respect to these persons and dear participants i good afternoon to the dignitaries resource persons and all participants a very warm welcome to you all for this international webinar on animal ethics and human genomics organized by department of zoology and iqsc of government degree college arup valley vishakhapatnam district andhra pradesh in collaboration with dr v s krishna government degree and pg autonomous college vishakhapatnam myself dr t samuel david ras organizing secretary of this webinar is an assistant professor in zoology working in government degree college arku valley <coughs> i am now going to present the welcome note to all the participants before man and women were created god created nature and then god said let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind and god blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and all and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth thus it is the animals and plants that have dominion over earth before man started living even evolution theory suggests that it is estimated that at least 200 million animals including mice rats frogs dogs cats rabbits hamsters guinea pigs monkeys fish and birds were used for scientific purpose annually and are killed in laboratories for biology lessons medical training curiosity driven experimentation and chemical drug food and cosmetics testing before their deaths some are forced to inhale toxic fumes others are immobilized in restraint devices for hours some have holes drilled into their skulls and others have their skin burned off or their spinal cords crushed they are deprived of everything that is natural and important to them and are treated like nothing more than disposable laboratory equipment in addition over 70 million experiments were conducted on animals for their tissues and are used to breed genetically modified animal strains the top 10 animal testing countries in the world are china followed by japan united states of america canada australia south korea united kingdom brazil germany and france history tells that some of the fox species were eliminated from the face of earth due to their use in dissections and many other animal species were still endangered we know that man is also not exempted from testing the only contention is the process of testing which is unethical this webinar throws light on these ethics and digital and stimulative alternatives to animal testing in addition to impart the latest trends in human genomics as the study to diagnose and prevent human diseases the theme of the webinar thus is live and let live with this brief introduction i now request our billard principal dr g g chandramouli garu to give his opening remarks and open the webinar thank you one and all over to you chandramouli sir sir please unmute and give your opening remarks and open the webinar thank you hello good afternoon and warm welcome to the international webinar on animal ethics and human genomics i am very thankful to conduct of webinar in arku degree college because because it is a tribal area it is awareness of creation and the webinar how how to conduct the webinar organization the webinar no one ever has thought of such a situation would arise where the world would come to a stand still at we the academicians need to nothing and been collaborating with each other through such online platform i am very much delighted to present our institution on this platform our cj government degree college it is situated in the sirani 
beautiful town the aruku valley we call it as the jewel of the western ghat and tourist call it as andhra uti the college is situated in 10 acres of land surrounded by tree bearing hills and valleys the college is established in the year 2011 and endowed with 18 teaching staff and non teaching staff five members outsourcing people two virtual labs two nss units youth cross unit women empowerment cell functional training placement center by the name jkc the jawahar nal center center is running is running success, successfully in catering to the overall development of 500 male students and 300 female students of tribal every year with this brief introduction about our college i welcome you all webinar to the webinar being organized by the staff of government degree college arco in collaboration with dr v s krishna government degree college autonomous visakhapatnam visakhapatnam district the webinar is organized to bring forth the idea of the ethical use of animals in research and teaching various national and inter international laws organizations and guidelines associated with it the webinar also through light on the emerging science of genomics and the emerging role of human genomics in public health practice in this platform i take the opportunity to express my gratitude gratitude to our to honorable commissioner sri mm nayak garu for his entire efforts for the all round development of degree college in the state of andhra pradesh principal of dr v s krishna college brc resource person from india and abroad and the organizing committee for organizing such a thought provoking webinar in this covid lockdown times i am very thankful to the department of zoology for taking initiation to conduct webinar i would like to end my op opening remarks by quoting the article 51 here mm -hmm. the constitution of india which places a duty on every citizen to protect and improve the natural environment including forests lakes rivers and wildlife and to have compassion for living in nature with this i pronounce the opening of this webinar so welcome to all participants faculties research scholars and students so thank you to all and all all the best thank you principal sir arupu valley now we have our first presenter ready i request assistant professor in commerce arupu valley ramesh garu to kindly introduce our first speaker for the today's first session over to you ramesh sir ramesh sir am i audible to you sir over to you sir ramesh sir you have to unmute yourself sir uh, thank you sir please carry on sir yeah ma'am am i audible ma'am yes sir please carry yeah on. yeah thank you ma'am okay good afternoon to all the participants of this international webinar i am ramesh tantuluri working as an assistant professor in government degree college arco valley it is indeed my proud privilege to introduce the stalwart in this field 
Dr. Mahmoud Abdul Qadir Akbar Shah, to all the participants of this international webinar on animal ethics and human genomics. Dr. Akbar Shah is presently working as a research coordinator at National College Tirushirappalli in India. Earlier, he worked as a director and chair in Mahatma Gandhi Center for Alternative to Use of Animals in Life Science Education at Bharti Das University Tirushirappalli from 2009 to 2017. Dr. Akbar Shah also worked as a professor of animal science from 1995 to 2008 in Bharti Dasan University. He held various prominent positions like head of animal science department, coordinator of school of life sciences, dean, faculty of science in the same university. Dr. Akbar Shah did his graduation in geology from Scott Christian College in Agarkoil and he completed his MSc from the Government Art College Coimbatore and he obtained his PhD from the prestigious University of Madras. His areas of research included endocrinology, reproductive biology, phytotherapy, cancer biology, obesity, in vivo and in vitro toxicology, and alternatives to animal experiments. Dr. Barsha had more than 250 research and review publications in peer-reviewed journals to his credit. His coverage could be found in PubMed, Science Direct, Research Gate, etc. He also authored more than 50, more than 15 review chapters in international edited publications. He is currently the editor in chief of the Journal of Endocrinology and Reproduction. Dr. Akbar Shah also worked as a president for two years in the Society for Reproduction Biology and Comparative Endocrinology. 23 candidates have been awarded PhD under his guidance so far. He also acted as a co-guide to many more candidates. He operated several sponsored projects from prestigious issues like UGC, DST, CSIR, and ICMR. He has also been awarded grants for international collaborative studies. He was awarded Govind Rajalu Gold Medal Oration Award of Society for Reproduction Biology and Comparative Endocrinology in 2016. He is a member of UGC Expert Committee to review use of animal in life science education. He was also a member of ICMR task force on fertility regulation and expanding contraceptive choices. He visited several countries like Australia, Norway, UCI, UK, Germany, Italy, France, Sri Lanka, Canada, Brazil, etc. He was also a visiting professor at the University of Kentucky, USA and also to King South University of Iraq. He has also been associated with animal alternative movement for well over two decades. He also conducted more than 70 workshops in digital alternatives and 20 workshops on cell culture techniques and in vitro toxicology. He attended several world congresses on alternatives in Rome, Montreal, Prague and Seattle. Well, with this brief introduction, I would like to request Dr. Akbar Shah to please start his session on this international webinar on the topic called Animal Protection Laws, Agencies and Organization. Now I request Dr. Akbar Shah to please Thank you. All, may I request all the participants kindly uh, mute yourself and kindly disable your videos so that we can have a better streaming quality of the presenter. Over to you, Akbar Shah, sir. Kindly unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Thank you, sir. So, I am going to a PowerPoint. Can you see that? Yes, sir. It is starting, sir. Okay. Sir, please maximize your screen, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It's okay, sir. It's okay. Okay. And sir, you can okay. Okay, sir. Please carry on, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Please carry on, sir. So, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I, I thank the organizing team, the, the colleagues from the two colleges for organizing this webinar and inviting me and my colleague Dr. Sadhya Narayana to make presentation on aspects of uh, animal ethics and human genetics. I am very glad that I am one of the resource persons of this, this webinar. Uh, the opening slide is simply to introduce me as to what my affiliations are and what today's program is. And uh, before I go to the actual topic of presentation, the animal protection laws, organizations, and so on, 
I would like to speak uh, a few points, uh, spend a few moments telling you about how, as a scientist of uh, working in a university and institute, um, happened to get into uh, the alternative movement of the country and uh, speak about non-animal methods. Well, uh, I take you to uh, the period to 1980s. Uh, that was the time when I was a lecturer in the in a college in Tiruchirappalli before I joined the university, which I did in 1986. So I am talking about a period between 80 and 85. Somewhere around 1985, when I was teaching in the college, uh, we used to have a frog dissection because that's the staple item for uh, lab exercises. So earlier days, we used to have plenty of frogs, and uh, the supplier never had any problem. And around 85, uh, there, there was difficulty in, in us getting frogs for our dissection. When I uh, used to ask the, the, the specimen supplier as to why he is not able to supply the frogs, uh, he, told, he, he told us that, sir, the, the uh, frogs are not anymore available in plenty and finding it very difficult to catch frogs. So I went on making uh, some kind of investigation as to what really happened? This, what you see on the screen, is a beautiful green frog. The, this is technically in those days called as Dana hexabactyla, and now we call it Euphrictix hexabactylus. So this this frog was the one which was used for dissection in the laboratories and for experiments in physiology. So as I said, during 1985 and around that period, we were not getting this frog. So, so I, as I said, I started making an investigation and found that. The, uh, the frogs are getting very rare, and what you see parallel with the Rana hexaractyl is another frog which you get in plenty these days, and that is called Rana synoflictis or Euphlictis synoflictis. But the other frog, Rana hexaractyl, has become rather rare. So, starting at trying to understand what really happened to these frogs over the short period of time, about five years, when we were not getting the frogs. Uh, I, I started realizing as to what, what really was happening, you know. During the late uh, 1970s, like 77, 78, 79, we uh, started the 10 plus 2 plus 3 pattern of education, wherein we introduced the plus 2 or higher secondary in colleges or schools, where we admitted number of students many times than what we were admitting in the earlier, earlier days in the pre-university course. So we had large number of students, like for example in Tamil Nadu, if you look at the statistics of that time, you could see that there were about about, uh, about 2 lakh students taking biology course, which accounts for about 0.2 million students. Each one would dissect, use at least 5 animals, I said at least a minimum of 5 animals. And uh, uh, putting together, it would be about, about 1 million frogs, which were used in Tamil Nadu alone during one year. And that was... The number, of equal number of students were there in Andhra, Karnataka, and all other states, Maharashtra, and so on. So, putting at somewhere around about about 30 million frogs were used every year in dissection, and this, slowly, you know, these were frogs which were large size frogs which were breeders, and when the breeders were removed from the natural habitat, there was a depletion of uh, the breeding animals, and they were not producing sufficient number of eggs to for the next generation to come up. So, within a period of short, uh, about, about five to six years, you know, the frog population got totally depleted. I don't try to say that dissection is the way we use this animal in the labs. It's not the only way, reason for the depletion, but that is one of the major reasons because there are other reasons like pollution, uh, diseases, and so on and so forth. So, because of my attachment and uh, of this particular species of frog, which was useful in, 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 in teaching and uh, training, uh, I got interested in understanding about what really caused this depletion, what would be the implications of this depletion. I got interested in biodiversity, and I, I, I used to be uh, motivating people not to use frogs in, in experiments and, and, and dissections, and used to address meetings, write articles, and what you see here is an article which I wrote in a, in a it's, it's published in a book, 
The title is State of Frogs in India, a case for discontinuation of use of frogs in resection experiments. It was published in this book, Biodiversity Conservation Challenges for the Future by Dandan and Hook. So that was uh, the wonderful, wonderful experience of trying to understand what really happened to our frogs and the message until now is that in, in view of the, the, the unlimited, uninhibited use of these frogs in classroom exercises, the frogs have become rather very rare. And today, if you look at a uh, look around, uh, you don't get these frogs in that many number as we used to have. And a uh, compulsion was there to help to remove frog as the animal uh, to be used in the dissection. So that is the reason uh, I, I got uh, I, I attached to these animals, the concept of biodiversity, and tell people not use animal, these animals in the dissection. So that was on one side, understanding the biodiversity and trying to find out what really happened to our frogs and such other species, like there are other species which has also become rather rare because of the large scale use in the laboratory courses. On the other side, I was also a scientist of reproductive biology and comparative endocrinology for well over 20, 30 years, a lot of research on these areas. And that led me to write very good articles and very good review chapters. And what you see here is a chapter I wrote in a book on mammalian endocrinology and male reproductive biology. The title of the chapter is The Epidemic Structure and Function. It's one of the most uh, uh, reputed chapter. People uh, refer it as an authoritative source. And uh, I also happen to be, because of this research, to be the editor of the Journal of Endocrinology and Reproduction and be the president of the Society for Reproductive Biology and Comparative Endocrinology. These are things which I really enjoyed. But uh, it so happened, incidentally, uh, I got an opportunity to, to get trained in cell culture techniques, uh, which I did when I went to the United States of America. And I, I made a comparison between the kind of approach that I make in using animal experimentation towards research and cell culture, the in vitro approach towards the research uh, endeavor. I, I, I realized that here. Uh, animal experimentation could be avoided, uh, not to deplete the animal population, to cause damage to the animals in the wild or animals in the lab. So I, 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 at that point, I decided that we would, I would lay emphasis on cell culture, that in vitro approach in research, rather than do animals experimentation in research. So the cell culture, uh, it, it took me to a better recognition and reputation. As a scientist, what you see here are two uh, very uh, well-referred articles that appeared in the recent times. One appeared in the ACS Omega just a few days back, and another article that appeared in the scientific reports. You know, it's a, it's a nature journal, and that happened in 2019. Just a sample to say that how uh, moving away from animal experimentation in research, uh, going into um, uh, in vitro or, or cell culture approach, you could do much better research and uh, taking to good publications, good visibility and reputation. So uh, this brought me to uh, frame a kind of a reputation as a person who is attached to non-animal methods in teaching and research. And so I got to be uh, recognized well over and I was invited to, to establish a center for alternatives to animal experiments in India that is called Mahatma Gandhi Doran Camp Center. We did it in, in Baris Dasan University in Tirchirapalli. And uh, what you see uh, in, the, in the presentation is the, the establishment, the Mahatma Gandhi Doran Camp Center that was started in, the, in uh, 2009. A beautiful building, a very good ambience, a lot of labs. And this is the only uh, facility in the whole country of India uh, meant for the alternatives movement teaching and trainable in the alternatives. I'm so happy that I have been associated with this moment. And uh, uh, in this endeavor, I got uh, I, I, into contact with two very good people that you see here, Professor Krishan Sharma, who is from Ajmer, and Professor M.C. Sadhya whom you see in the presentation. He is going to be the speaker, the next speaker of the day. So we formed a team and we went around and telling people giving demonstration, giving training uh, in connection with uh, changing from animal experimentation and dissection to non-animal methods. It has been wonderful days. Uh, so that is the uh, brief introduction as to how I got into 
the non-animal method movement or the natives movement. So now coming to the topic of the today's uh, talk, uh, the animal protection laws. So in that, I start with telling you that what are the current, I limit my talk to use of animals in labs. There are other ways like in food, in agriculture, um, in, in, uh, as, 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 as for the leather, for sorts of, I, I don't enter upon uh, those areas. I am a teacher, I am an academician, I speak about animal use in labs. So there are two ways you can use animals and uh, what is use of animals in research and testing and other is use in education and training. I will be uh, touching upon both these areas today. So you have all the like um, you use animals in the uh, physiology, drug discovery, in psychology labs, in toxicity testing and in the classrooms we use, use animals for dissections and experiments. And these animals are either caught from the wild, from starting from your permission to the monkey. There are many animals apart from the, 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 the wild. And the other animals which are mostly used in experiments in the toxicity testing, drug discovery, you get these animals uh, bred in the laboratory. So you have on the right side, you got uh, the, the, the mother and the fox of the rat. So these are laboratory bred animals. Uh, looking at uh, the use of these animals in, in research endeavors, in experimental uh, uh, sciences and towards uh, laboratory uh, learning and, and training, well, you had some issues like uh, we, we speak about um, animal use in education and training, we speak about curricular issues. Now, the question that we raised, I have no time to go into the details of the, the, the PowerPoints which I am making. Uh, the, the gist of the PowerPoint is that dissection as an animal uh, is a laboratory exercise has become an obsolete process because it was started way back in 1920. 100 years back at that time, we had only cardiac and in order to take our biology as courses. Now we have very many new courses relegating these cardiacs and in order to take the background. You need to have more extensive knowledge about cell biology, genetics, biotechnology, molecular biology and so on. So emphasis must be on these subjects and naturally in terms of curriculum, we should lie low with the animal uh, organization of anatomy and with the dissections and lay more emphasis on the more recent uh, topics, more recent subjects in biology. Well, there must be some objectives as to why we use animal experiments, animal exercises in the lab. And uh, what I uh, try to emphasize is that the curricula of a wide range of biological, medical and health related courses in which physiology and pharmacology feature prominently, traditionally include laboratory experiments that reflect the practical nature of these. I mean, this is because we are doing the, the, the subjects are science subjects. We used to be doing the practicals. And there must be a reason why you do these exercises, connecting them to the, the theory courses that you learn. And um, the objectives are not very clearly defined. And um, the question that we raise is, what do really dissections teach? Some st some students, most of the students used to say that uh, they perform dissections without knowing the purpose. I used to tell me, tell, uh, realize myself when I was a teacher in the college, I never told my students why they are doing dissection. They did dissection, I was engaging in dissection because it is there in the syllabus or the curriculum. What they are expected to learn, what they are expected to understand, how they are going to connect this dissection to what they see in the animal, what they trace are, are, are exposed in the animal to what they learn in the theory, it was never really done. They are two independent isolated things, what they learn in the classrooms and what they learn in the, in the, in the laboratory, uh, not very clearly related to what they learn in the, in the theory courses. So, uh, the curricular, curriculum wise, well, there is no very clear relevance as to why they do the dissections and the, the question they ask is then why do you do uh, these exercises which do not have a direct relevance to what they are really learning in the classrooms. And how, why and, 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 and the dissection which is not going to be relevant to them in the future in their career and whatever career they take up unless some people who go become teachers or who become uh, scientists, very few, hardly a few of them go to that and others take to professions which do not require any experience to have dissected animals or conduct experiments or animals. 
So here is a quote, it was a scientist who wrote in, uh, uh, in 2012, I enjoy this, 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 this quote, too often even the active learning elements of today's teaching regimens are laboratory courses simply repeat classical experiments rather than engage students in compelling experiments with the possibility of excitement of true discovery. They do mundane, monotonously due to these actions without knowing what they do and why they do and ultimately it's not going to be useful to them. Rather what is important is the curriculum should be such that students are put into exciting learning, uh, a kind of a discovery kind of or experience based understanding of the subject. So. Uh, that is the core. So curricula, curricula wise there are issues and then the next is about the, the teaching and learning method, we call it pedagogy, Te the educational approach. Now we, we have to go with the change, we may take today for example, we are now, I am talking to you sitting in Trichrapalli, you are people in many places in Andhra, not even in one place, sitting in, in, your, in your, uh, your own places uh, where you are now at present and we are able to talk to each other, this is technology, the, the information technology has made rapid strides and the technological advancements should be taken to advantage in the teaching learning process also as we do it today and it is possible to do that uh, in, in the laboratory exercises also. You can do the same kind of learning, you learn, you earn the same kind of experience of handling the animal using the information technology or computer assisted technological learning processes uh, without really looking at our handling of rock. So these are based on educational technology, so change in turn with the development in pedagogy. So teaching method and learning method in the laboratory, it is possible to do learn about animal without really bringing animal to the lab or sacrificing the lab and dissecting it, conducting experiments. And we're looking at the biodiversity point of view, there are a lot of depletion of species for several other reasons, you know, that the climate change, uh, the, 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 uh, the other, other issues in the environment, animals are getting depleted and we are contributing to this depletion through using these animals in the experiments which really are not learning us, taking us to good learning or efficient or anything useful in our future career. So environmentally, uh, from biodiversity perspective, animal experimentation and dissections are depleting the species. So this story I told you earlier. And the next issue is uh, the people who are exposed to or given opportunity to dissect the animal, they are allowed to think that these are they are dispensable objects. The animals are dispensable objects. You can handle them crudely, roughly, scalpel them, kill them, pick them, and uh, that is uh, no, no respect for life. Automatically, you look at the girl, the face of this girl. Now, she doesn't like this dissection. So ultimately, this hatred of animal towards animal, it continues to, to throw her life. So these are ethical issues which come up. And here you can see an animal which was generated through the, the gene uh, genetic manipulation approach of our DNA technology. And we generate these kind of animals in labs and the homogeneity of the whole animal is lost. How do you expect this animal to be behaving like an ordinary rat that you come across either in the field or in the laboratory? So uh, this is the way ethical issues are raised. So having said about the issues in education, now I'll give bit tell about the experimentation approach, um, how animals came into experimental biology. You know, you see a person here who is clogged by not. Uh, he was, he is called as the, considered as the father of model experimental medicine. He was the one, of course, animals were used in experiments, in, in research, in testing, in drug discovery, much before Black Bernard. But this man, the scientist, was one who actually was emphatic in making use of animals in, in, in uh, drug testing and discovery in physiological experiments. And uh, uh, some of some of his expressions uh, have been very, very cruel to be animals. For example, he would say, yeah, as a scientist who is a physiologist, he does not hear the animal's cries of pain. When you do experiments like pick the frog or, 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 or do a uh, you puncture, you, 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 are, you are putting the animal to trouble, to animal to uh, stress and strain, and, and to him, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be concerned about it. 
he sees nothing but his idea an organism and organism is concealed from him secret he believed that the organism is concealing a secret how can he how can one believe that there is a secret in it and it is, it is concealing it from me so that is that is inhuman to be treating the animals like this so he he he, he given expression that whatever even you expose an animal to a toxic and that is certain things happen in the animal it is exactly the same that don't happen to the human which is today i would say as a scientist a high caliber i would say it is an absurd thinking it is not the same response in animal and in the human the responses in many times are are rather very different and it is that way you have the introduction of animals in experimental uh, sciences now in these ex- experiments you get large number of animals used and uh, you can see uh, in in drug testing in 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 food quality testing Uh, in agricultural practices um then in any 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 areas you get lot of animals used and you get um, uh, guinea pigs rabbits hamsters so on, and so on and you have mice and rats and you could see the lower terrific pictures the, ex- the 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 expression the responses of the animals to these experiments so you can see animals which are subjected to what is called as the trace test this is a test which is used for uh finding the, uh, the the irritation potential of some chemicals including cosmetics and drugs similarly uh, raise eye test you can see the rabbit is having its eye with inflammation because of putting some chemical into its its eye towards testing it whether it is um, it is it is causing inflammation and you get the, the rabbit on the other side um, uh, which is pyrogen test to find if the test is made a substance tested is 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 inducing fever causing fever in the rabbit so this way the animals are used in in such large numbers as as samuel said several several million 300 million animals are used in experiments alone at living alone sections and hello please once again the center it is some interruption so animals are used in large numbers and uh, on one side you have use of animals in education and uh, classroom labs and on other side you have animals used in testing in experiments and in in, in drug discovery processes in in understanding diseases so this enormity of use of animals in in fact that even uh, The, the scientists themselves, the teachers themselves, have been came to be uh, bothered about it. So a committee was constituted in 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 1950s in UK, and uh, these two scientists, Russell and Burke, they came out with a book, which is called the the Kibben Experimental Technique, and they proposed what is called as the the three R uh, uh, principle. Uh, they said the animal experimentation should be taken to the minimum. Use of animals, uh, yes, sacrifice of animals, harm done to the animals should be taken to the minimum, and to that extent, either they should be the uh, animal use must be replaced. Do mean adopt methods that do not require animals, or uh, reduce reduce the number of animals used, or refine improve the way the animals are handled. So that is how you get uh, animal which are animals used in experimentation and animals used in. Uh, In, in the, the classroom laboratories, and the scientists themselves and the teachers themselves have become agitated about this vice produce, and they have started thinking about methods of curtailing the use of animals in experimentation and in teaching, and and to that effect, we have several laws that are protection to the animals over the period of time. This has been also parallelly evolving. You get legal protection to animals. You look at the uh, our constitution. Use the blanket protection to these animals. It's in 51A G. It says it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to protect and improve natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for all living creatures. So, constitutionally, in fundamental rights, as a citizen of India, we are expected to be safeguarding the interests of the environment. And to be compassionate to the living, all living creatures. So uh, that speaks anything. I mean, a great lot about the responsibility of the citizens of India, the compassion, love, and affection that should be uh, uh, 
showering on these animals. We have the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, one of the one of the modern acts of the world, and it has been updated from time to time. It starts about wild animals, both flora and fauna, and it aims at conservation of animal and habitat. So you have the the various chapters coming under the uh, Wildlife Protection Act 1972, and uh, at the end of it, you have a number of schedules where the animals are allocated. Animals which are given absolute protection. You cannot touch the animal. You can't do anything. You can't do anything with wild animal. Anything with these. With, um, you can't do anything with these animals. And then schedule three and four, a little bit of little bit of protection. I mean, a protection is given, but uh, some restriction. You cannot be blanket approval uh, using these animals in your uh, You should. Get approval of the competent authority to make use of these animals, and so that must be given, someone giving you the permission, like wildlife authority. And it is here, Prague, which we spoke about in the early, in the early, early part, uh, which belongs. Now, if you are capturing frog and using it in laboratories, uh, subject to a, a fine of about 10,000 rupees or uh, imprisonment up to three years. So you have Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 absolute protection. Schedule three and schedule four, little liberal, and but you should do it with, with permission, and you, you can't handle them without the permission, or at least you will become uh, punishable. And schedule five are animals which you can you can little uh, liberal, you can handle them, you can even hunt them. And schedule six is concerned with uh, the plants, particularly plants that are protected that cannot that cannot be planted and uh, and used in the uh, any purpose. So very special mention about status of frogs in the Wildlife Act of India. So you, you cannot capture it, you cannot have it in the, in the lab. This will attract stringent punishment with a fine of rupees twenty-five thousand and or imprisonment up to three years. And uh, it has been there, but uh, people use it in, in labs, in dissections, and uh, and also in some in some part of the country, particularly in the northeast. Uh, without knowing the law, people are still using it as a as a as a point. So you have now the the uh, 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 wildlife act. Next, we go to another 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 law, I mean regulation guideline, which which protection to the animals. The widespread use of these animals in dissections and experiments in education has brought a lot of pressure on the university grants commission, the regulatory authority of the. Our education of our country. Um, this University Grants Commission, a uh, lot uh, of exercise and and endeavors, meetings, discussions, deliberations. Uh, one phase of activity that happened during uh, 2011, there was a, a, a committee going through a lot of exercises, uh, discussions, and uh, a lot of these deliberations, there was. Uh, 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 Guideline that came up, guideline for discontinuation of the section and animal experimentation in zoology and life science. This doesn't deal anything with research. This deals only about use of animals in the classrooms, the dissections and experiments in, in, in courses. So at that first phase, it said, well, reduce, reduce the number of animals used, like rather than 10, 10 species to be decided to dissect, uh, limit it to me. say one species, one animal, kind of thing. So a little bit of permission, but a lot of restriction to use animals in that sections. And uh, and that itself was not enough, like there was much pressure, more pressure on the University Grants Commission. So a second phase of activity came up in 2014, that was we call it phase two. And uh, in, in, in that exercise, the University Grants Commission came out with the recommendation of banning use of animal dissection. A repeat use of animal in dissection. It doesn't speak about any 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 ban to use animals in experiments, like physiology experiment kind of thing, or understanding ecology or embryology. But don't use animals in dissection. That happened in 2014. So, so the notification came like um, uh, the undergraduate and postgraduate uh, programs, uh, both at major and allied there was no animal from any species shall be dissected either by teachers or students for any purpose. So this uh, this regulation 
guideline which came from uh, University Grass Commission. There has been a lot of debate going on after that, up to 2014, but ultimately the University Grants Commission stood uh, fast on the, uh, the, the notification and today we are not supposed to be using these animals, any wild animal uh, or even laboratory animal, wild bred animal in this uh, classroom purposes. So you can't decide, but experiment is okay, it is permitted like. Next, you have the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960. This is a different uh, percept altogether. This was an act which came up uh, by introduction into Rajya Sabha uh, in 52-56 by Shrimadhi Rukmani Devi Arundel, a social activist. She was sort of love for animal. She introduced this bill into the parliament. And then Pani Jawaharlal Nehru was the first prime minister at that time. A lot of respect for this, 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 uh, that Arundel, I mean, uh, Rukmani Devi Arundel. So he, he thought that this is such a sensitive and important issue that it shouldn't be a, a, a private member uh, subject. It should be uh, the, the, uh, the government should be moving the resolution. So he, 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 he brought it as an official uh, bill into the parliament, of course, go through Dr. Rukmini Devi. So from a private member endeavor, it became uh, uh, like a, a government sponsor uh, uh, bill. And this was approved in 1960, you call it the uh, Act Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960. And it came to be subsequently amended by a central act of uh, 26th of 1982. So this also, uh, this is under organization, I mean the authority, the law, under which the the uh, committee for the purpose of control and supervision of experiments and animals uh, it is, is coming, I will reach Dr. Sadhya is going to speak to you in detail. So, uh, cruelty to animal is also an important subject in the Indian context. Now, what does this, this uh, act say? This act is, a, it, it, it speaks about uh, to do what to do and what not to do when it comes to animal experimentation. So it says experiments are performed with the due care and humanity and that as far as possible experiments involving uh, operations are performed under the influence of some anesthetic. Don't keep the animal conscious when you do the experiment. I use an anesthetic and uh, when I use experiments under the influence of anesthetics are so injured, they should be, uh, their recovery would involve serious suffering and ordinary destroyed while still insensible. Use, uh, 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 you sacrifice it, don't keep it alive to suffer the pain. So, and then these two are the very important uh, provisions of the law. Experiments on animals are avoided wherever it is possible to do so. Avoided as far as possible to do so. An example in schools, hospital, colleges and the like for teaching devices is a books model. In that place, you have to use teaching devices such as books, models, films and the like. That should be okay for us. And the um, the next part is, it says that don't use animals or do experiments merely for the purpose of acquiring manual skill. So these are the two parts which are uh, very important in terms of uh, people who are engaged in education, conducting research, doing testing and so on and so forth. So you have got to be uh, extremely careful in deciding on whether to conduct an animal experiment at all. And if an animal experiment is done and you would not then handle the animal with care and comfort with an anesthesia and uh, uh, to be very humane in, in dealing with that, don't do, use the animal for just for the purpose of developing skill. In, in this action, what really do is, if you teach, you ask your teachers, they would say this action is done more to handle, the, in handling skill, this action skill. Now, so this is skill development, and therefore, uh, these are areas which are taken care of prevention of... Are you, am I audible? You are audible, sir. sir. You are so audible. If there are questions, please come up. Yes. I request the participants, if any of the participants have questions, you can kindly mm -hmm. ask, unmute yourself and ask. If any of the participants have questions, 
you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. There must be some point to clarify. No questions? Sir, there is a question. Yes. Uh, I'm reading out. In India, yes. po poor infants are dying due to bites of non-domestic dogs. Aggressive dogs are spreading rabies by their bites. Yes, okay. we have to protect. Yes, we have to protect animal rights. But what about poor people? Please enlighten. Well, uh, I, I made it very clear in my. In my I made it very clear when I started. I am not going to enter into areas other than use of animals in uh, teaching uh, education in laboratory experiments like the drug testing and uh, the toxicity testing. I am not. I am not. Uh, I am not uh, familiar with the issues. The issues, the other issues like the, the wild. I mean, the the dogs. Uh, I mean, you know, the dogs are. Uh, undergoing a kind of sterilization process whereby they are not allowed to reproduce and produce the next generation. These kind of endeavors are there. Well, uh, there are there are certain specific laws as to how these street dogs are to be handled. Uh, I don't say they should be protected. I don't say they should be killed. There are there are specific uh, recommendations that are to be adapted practiced in these cases. I do sympathize those people who are going. We are affected by these these straight dogs, particularly rabies, uh, and I am not very familiar with the law which which governs uh, these these dogs. Yes, sir. Good evening, yes, sir. Good evening. This, this is Krishna from uh, Bangalore. Yes, sir. Suppose uh, if we want to make a uh, uh, ethical clearance committee. Yes. So what are what are the members has to be included in that committee? So this is for uh, this this is purpose. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer this question, but next talk is about the CPCSCA and the Institutional Analytics Committee, and therefore, okay. I think question, it will be explained in Dr. Sajjan Arana's talk. Yeah, Please yeah, wait for a few minutes. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank, yes, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Anything else? There is, there is one more question, sir. Someone has yes. posted. Yes. Uh, does usage of fishes and shrimps for research purpose require ethical committee clearance? Uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, there is a very clear law which says that animals that are used as food, food, food consumable fish, I mean animals like fish and all, you don't need to take these animals for ethical clearance. But recently, I do not know why it happened, uh, in the CPCSCA uh, endeavor, all animals are included, including uh, the lower animals also, invertebrates also. Uh, we are now working out. The, we are interacting with the. We are uh, dealing with the CPCSCA, uh, the, the ministry, uh, to to go back to the older law. Now, actually, what is uh, prescribed in 2003 should be a holding board. There has not been any revision beyond that. And and what is some places some com some CPCC institutional committees some uh, uh, nominees are emphasizing that lower animals are also included in it. But that, I don't have a document. I don't have a document which uh, which, which says that uh, the lower animals are also included in it. Therefore, to me, in my experience, my expertise, fish you may, uh, you may not uh, have to go for an ethical clearance. Okay. There was a reference from Samuel about this issue some time back, and I gave them the legal provision, and they were helped out in publishing their paper, uh, which, which, which uh, where I, I, I said, fish use of fish in experiment does not require ethical clearance. Okay. So one and one more one more query from Prerona Vishwas. Uh, the animals that are bred in the laboratory are usually unable to sustain in the wild. If a situation arises that the experimental animal use is totally banned, what might be the fate of the laboratory bred animals? The animals are bred only when there is a need for experiment. Once there is a ban, 
then you don't breed, you don't produce, you don't generate these animals. This is this is answer to the question. Something beyond that, well, what is one issue in that? You remember I I, I gave a provision in fourteen in class fourteen of the prevention of uh, in, in the law where it says that when it comes to uh, use of animals in certain drug testing or understanding diseases, you can use animals. So, uh, but off the record, like for the purpose of sensitizing you. Uh, as long as there is a requirement that you should be using animal data, producing animal data uh, for drug approval or drug uh, discovery, uh, uh, you will have to be doing experiments and therefore total ban of animal experimentation perhaps is not going to happen in the, at least for some, some time to come. Unless you are able to make an artificial animal, an artificial human, and, and, and the endeavor is going on, like a human on chip. The, 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 uh, the uh, trial is going on, the approach is there. So only until it comes, animal experimentation will be there and animals will be produced. But animals will be generated, lab animals will be generated only if you are having experiments which requires uh, animal experimentation. So uh, hypothetically, don't, don't ask question what will happen if all animal, if experiments are started. I tell you, it's not going to be stopped at, at least for some time to come. And therefore, animals will be produced only to the requirement. We don't produce animals beyond the requirement. So uh, that answers your question. Anything else? Is there any replacement of animals in field of biomedical research? So this is someone's query. Now, we, we can't generalize it like the total replacement of animal in biomedical research. You get issue by issue. There is a replacement coming up, like for example, the other day, when in the course of the talk, I mentioned about the ban of animal experimentation in the context of uh, cosmetic testing. Uh, five years back, if you would, ban, would have banned animal experimental cosmetic testing, you wouldn't have cosmetics coming up. Today, we have alternative methods. Uh, in vitro methods are now available and um, uh, reconstructed human epidermis models have come which is totally in vitro. So you don't need any more uh, reason to do animal experimentation to test the cosmetics. So a ban comes only when you have an, an appropriately approved alternative method is there. So the ban will come only when there is an alternative method. Okay. Have you, have you answered the question? I don't know. Okay, can we stop the uh, question answer session here? Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank well, you so thank much you. for such a um, vivid explanation about animal rights. Thank you very much. Hope all the participants have uh, taken back something from today's lecture. Thank you very much for being a part of today's webinar, sir. Thank you very much. I'm happy that I am associated with this exercise and uh, uh, tell people about the alternative methods and laws which protect the animal. Thank you very much and uh, thank you, Samuel and Vani, for the wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Sir. Thanks all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So mo moving forward to the next presentation, I now request over to you, madam. Yes, madam, thank you. Can I, am I audible, madam? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Yes, yes ma'am. Good afternoon, respected officials and faculty of collegiate education and participants of various colleges. I am Dr. V. Ratnabharati, assistant professor from Department of Zoology, Dr. V. S. Krishna, Government Degree College, Vizag. I take this opportunity and privilege to introduce one of the eminent resource person of today's webinar, Sri M. C. Satyanarayana Garu, who is retired associate professor from Department of Zoology and Wildlife Biology, a perfect combination of animal sciences from 
ABC College, Maila Duturai of Tamil Nadu. Professor Satinarayana Garu, a multilingual scientist, come professor, completed PG from Pachyapan Degree College and awarded his PhD degree from University of Madras. He has 29 years of teaching experience and 35 years of uh, research experience in the field of animal sciences and wildlife studies. He held many positions uh, as a scientist, as a postdoctoral research fellow, and various research projects he uh, carried out, which are funded by CSR, ICMR, UGC, and DST. And uh, uh, as a scientist, he had a very good number of research publications in peer-reviewed journals, and he attended symposia with uh, uh, publishing many proceedings uh, and newsletters, and more than 100 abstracts in various seminars, workshops, and symposia. Under his legal guide, Dr. Sanders obtained PhD, 17 students were awarded with MPhil degrees and more than 30 students uh, had awarded as well. Apart from academic success, Sir was awarded by UGC as UGC Research Award and UGC Emeritus Fellow and uh, another international Network for Human Education, United Kingdom, for his contribution on animal welfare activities. So, and uh, he was also honored by Parent Teacher Student Federation for acquiring academic excellence in Tamil Nadu, a spe special award uh, named Occasional Service Award for outstanding contribution in the field of research was given by Rotary Club of uh, Mailadu Thurai, and this is one more credit to his uh, academic career. Apart from this, Sir acted as a member in Training and Research Advisory Committee, Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, and Mahatma Gandhi Dorenkam Center for Animal Alternative Alternatives Bharatidasan University of Tamil Nadu. Internationally, Sir visited SARC countries and also one of the uh, wildlife uh, uh, sanctuary continent Africa for his uh, wildlife studies. He is a nominee of CPCSEA by Government of India, Minister of Animal Welfare Division. And the concept of this particular uh, branch is uh, Control and Supervision of Experiments on Animals, Internal Animal Ethics Committee. And with this uh, few remarks, I wish to mention that we are all fortunate to have uh, a nationally and internationally renowned resource person as a speaker for this uh, international webinar on animal ethics. Uh, and I request Professor Satyanarayana Garu to deliver his talk on animal experiments, regulations and guidelines. Thank you, Madam. Please uh, connect to Sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Now, over to you, sir. Okay. Not yet, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hello? Uh, it is starting, sir. Yes, can you please maximize yes. it, sir? Full screen? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. It's okay? Thank you, sir. Please continue, sir. So, good afternoon to everybody. From the MRK, Namaskar Alu. I'm very happy that Nomi Degree College, Arupu Valley, has planned to have a, an international webinar on ethics and human genomics. And uh, really, uh, it's, it's a great achievement for the Department of Zoology. I am also being the Zoology faculty. I congratulate all the faculty members and also the uh, principal and the management of this college. Now, today I am going to just address on the animal experiments, especially on the committee for the purpose of control and supervision of experiments on animals with guidelines and regulations. And why we have to study, why I have to address the guidelines and regulations of the uh, CPC which involves in the animal experiments. Now, I, being an animal ethics nominee or the CPC nominee for Institutional Animal Ethics Committee, I have visited a number of college animal facilities, university animal facilities, and also I have visited a number of the industry research and develop, like for example, the orchid pharma industry at Chennai. So I have visited a number of animal facilities, and I know the scenario, the present scenario of various animal facilities who are involved in the experiment and their condition of this one. Then after seeing all these 
after gaining the experience being an animal ethics committee for the various institutes and also undergoing various research proposals then i feel that we have to sensitize the students researchers and the teachers with regard to the cpc guideline and regulations it is very pity that though they have the animal houses they have the institute animal ethics committee most of the members most of the research scholars most of the teachers they are not aware of the guidelines and regulations now already dr ambasha said that the under the animal welfare act we have the uh, cpc which has been established and in order to ensure the safety for the extinct animals this has been started in the 1981 1981 and now i am going to talk on the guidelines okay why there is a cpc guidelines first of all you have asked what should be there the goal of the cpc guidelines is to promote the humane care of the animal very important humane care of the animals they are used in the biomedical and the behavioral research and the testing what is the objective in providing specialty that will enhance the animal well being and also for the biological knowledge and of all the in welfare of the human kind we have going to test these animals and for the human kind for the human welfare that is the main goal of the cpc guideline right? these goals are on based on the glp good laboratory practice now uh, whatever i am going to speak is that you don't worry about it say all the guidelines are available in the website and it's very pretty that most of the researchers and most of the animal welfare people are doing research on this and they are not aware of these certain websites for information cpc that a very good website you can go to the website you can give your home and you have online services acts and rules forms guidelines everything is available on the website and like that you can have the number of documents with the regard to the uh, acts with, with regard to the legal protection animals or guidelines and also the regulations of the cpc if the one can go through this each one okay this are now and very recently in 2018 the cpc this the final process brought out a very good excellent hand that is called compendium it is nothing but a collection of concise but detailed information about particular subject especially for this subject experiments on animal so everybody must download this if you are interested in doing the animal experiment if you want to have the uh, laboratory if you want to have the animal facility or the animal houses and if you want to do the iac please kindly download this compendium go through this and thorough with that because we are having a lacking in the background knowledge we are not able to do very good experiment we are not able to follow the legal procedures involved in the animal experiments now we all know that the experimental laboratory animals used prior to clinical use that is very very why you are using the laboratory animal for the experiments because we are going to have a clinical studies after that before that prior to clinical use in order to assess the efficacy of drugs what is the effect of drug if i give it curcumin what is the efficacy of this curcumin in the animal before you have trials for the clinical use and we are going to do the animal challenge experiment we are going to challenge your drug your compound or your natural maybe a product with, with these animals how we are going to react with that so that is the purpose main aspect of conducting the experiment is that we are going to do conduct some experiment on the animals now for this studies we are going to involve the laboratory experiment animals such as the mice rat rabbit guinea pig and hamster now if you want to have the cpc guideline all of you must know about the animal facility or animal houses and some of you might have uh, visited the animal facility or some of you might have been doing research on the animal aspects and doing the experiment animals on the involving various laboratory animal and uh, you might have seen number of animal facilities i have gone through number of animal facilities and animal houses in various places and based on that you just i will just talk on the animal houses now this is what you require for the cpc guideline you must have a separate animal house but don't worry about that this i'm showing a very big building for the animal house you may become very panic don't worry about it if you are in a college if you want to be smaller way in your college campus or your institute have a small building or a small hall first thing is you have to see the facility first because don't imagine if i show that is a very big suburb you might have visited the 
the NIR, National Institute of Nutrition in Hyderabad, where it's a very big facility, animal facility, and we, I have visited a number of GM, international, I mean, uh, the uh, licensed, uh, good laboratory practice uh, animal facilities, we have in the colleges, universities, I visited. One is the physical condition. You have to be designed of the facility is very important. Based on our feasibility, what is our funding? How much our college can provide for the animal facility? So think about the economy of the operation is very important. So you have to design before starting the animal facility or the animal work, plan for the animal facility to your needs, to your economic feasibility, and design the animal facility, animal houses, and size of the animal house, and depends, it's mainly depend on the research activity. How many of the researchers in your college going to do that? Research on the laboratory animal experiments. And there are two research scholars or two faculty members who are going to do that. Based on that, you design your the physical building. Now, you must have well planned. See, before, suppose you want to have, you are going to construct, you are going to plan it for a new one, have a building plan. Like, you are going to construct your house, you will think for one day, two days, two day, ten days, and you discuss with your family member, and you finally come to a, with your architect, and you become a building plan. For that I mean, house also, this is a very big plan. You must have a corridors like this, you must have a uh, train corridors, we have a dirty corridor, different animal facilities are, this is for the GLP lab, you can design on your own. Now, the experiment not to be, what is the condition of this your building, or condition of this animal house? It should not be exposed to dust, very important, it should not be exposed to smoke and noise, and it should not, not be there for wild rodents, insects and like pests. And your building and the cages and the environmental of animal rooms, must have the aforesaid factors free on the quality of animals. Suppose you have a dust free, smoke free, noise free, free from the rodents, insects, and birds, and you have a very good building and cages, you have a very good environment for the animal rooms and the animals, and this will speak on the quality of the animals. Now you better visit a number of animal houses or at least you have seen them, animal, or your institute might have a maintaining a animal. Now you think about this, whether you are doing this. Whether these observations are made in your animal facility, then you can assess your quality of the animals or animal house. Now, what is the physical building required by the CPC? These are the guidelines I am talking about. The building material is very durable. The building material is very, very must be durable, moisture proof, fire resistant, vermin and pest resistant, water line drain pipe should be very good, electric internet should be very good, animal room doors, they are rust proof, dust proof. No gaps in the doors. And I'll tell you my experience. I have seen a number of animal facilities, and it's very quickly that these are not conditions are just done by number of institute. There is no drain pipe because on the floor you have the stagnated water, they have the not the moisture proof uh, floor is not there, you have the, a lot of dust, rusted uh, doors should be there, rusted window doors should be there, and there will be some gaps also in the doors so that the this like rats, even the snakes enter into an animal facility. So think about the animal facility, what are the conditions of the guidelines by the CPC? Now, floors are dry, I am speaking on that. Now, the floor should be smooth and moisture like this. There should be non-absorbent skid flow, very important skid flow. Another is resistant to acids, or we are going to use some acids and solvents, and this should be resistant for this. And the detergent disinfectant should be used. Drains should be very clear and drainage will be adequate facilities, when you have the water course, it should not be stagnated in your animal house, and we have the rapid removal of water, when you have a cleaning or whatever thing, the excess water should be removed, really, and the walls and ceiling free from cracks. I have seen some of the animal houses, there will be cracks in the wall, so you can see the ants coming inside the animal facility, even from there there will be a lot of cracks, the squirrels will be coming, and because you are going to give the feed to the your animal laboratory animal, so this attracted by this rodent and the other animals, so they come inside the water so that we require the CPC has said that we should be there should not be any uh, cracks in the walls or ceilings, and that means there are imperfect junctions. For example, if you have a doors or a window door, there will be some gaps in that, so there should not be there. And you can see check the ceilings and the corner if there should not be any gaps or cracks. The other thing is very important is the of the physical structure, what we are doing, sanitation cleanliness. Sanitation is very, very essential in the animal groups. 
And the people used to ask me, sir, why are you not talking about sanitation animals? We don't have sanitation, we don't have food, the rest of it. No, don't talk about it. When you do of the animal experimental, these are the essential sanitation, very, very important. You go to the animal rooms, be very clean, and the corridors, your passages, your storage spaces, rooms, to be cleaned with a detergent, disinfected regularly, your cages, animal cages, animal racks, the feeders, watering device to be washed and sterilized. And I understand the animal facility, they have the auto climbing system. They never do sterilize, very, very pity. Some of it, but don't do that, please kindly. When you have the excellent animal uh, animal facility in your college, already some of you might have it, please kindly have this auto clap and sterilize it all your equipment, water bottles, other things, devices. Now, this is what I was in one of the Sintrapoli uh, Pharmacy College, where they have a small animal facility. See, this is not a question of small or big. They have a small animal facility, see the our neatness. And they have, see, the system of, they have their own the footwear. You cannot wear your footwear. If they have maintaining a footwear, spare footwear, you can just wear it and enter. There, 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 is, a, there is a disinfectant. Now, everybody is of the COVID. We are all very familiar with this, the sterilizing your hands, whatever it may be, sanitizers. So, like that, we have the sanitizer. Then, excess water. Excuse filter. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. I'm interrupting, sir. Excuse okay. me. Uh, okay. Someone has uh, started a presentation. Uh, so, your presentation uh, uh, is a little disturbed. Can you please uh, stop okay. uh, stop and again start the presentation from where you have left, okay. sir? Okay. Okay. Full screen. And please, full screen. Uh, put it on the full screen, sir, please. So, now I'll go here. So, okay. Got it? Okay, sir. Oh. So, this is what I told you. It is a small, small facility in a college. You design for it. And you can make it really. Say, so, okay, this is what I require for animal facility. This is what CPC requires. The animal facility. Sanitation. Now, now you, you must have a... You, you can worry about air conditioning. See, you must have air condition for your animal houses. Animal facility. Really, the, it's a, now it's a mandate. CPC guidance is mandatory. All the animal houses must have air condition in their animal rooms. Now, why I put functional air condition? I have visited the animal facility. They have the air conditioner, but it's a non-functional. I used to put my minutes of meeting. There should be a functional air conditioner. Now also you can go and visit some of the animal facility. They have the air conditioner, but it may not be in a working condition. That's why I always put it as a functional air conditioner should be there. Now this is what the, this, this is the GLP animal facility, you not worry about it. This is what they conduct the, the like surgery. Whatever the animal uh, experiment you have to conduct after that, you will sacrifice the or euthanize the animal and uh, the, you know, euthanize the animal and you can have want to have the internal uh, part or the liver and the kidney. This is what the facility is not worry about it. This is the facility you can also know about it. Now, now very important is the animal care, very important. There should be technical personnel who is going to look after all the animal. It's very, very sad that most of people are not worried about that. They will just send some of the, uh, the institutes I have seen. They send it some biochemistry or zoology, the technical assistant or the laboratory assistant to that animal care. Because you have the work in there, whenever there's no work, they will send. No, it's not really. Animal care technical personnel, animal care program required a technical and husbandry support. Institute should employ person training in laboratory animal science. Very, very important. I have seen some of the institute where they send the uh, zoology attender or the uh, zoology laboratory assistant for the animal house to maintain. No, this is not the way. You must have a separate, full fledged a person a trained in laboratory animal science. Now, very important is veterinary care. All the animals should have a veterinary care. It is a responsible to veterinarian. Or a person who trained in laboratory. For so example, you have the one or any person, taking a person you want to have, you just send it for the training. For example, <coughs> National Institute of uh, Nutrition, NIN. Uh, just a minute. National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. They are giving a regular program for 15 days. You can just send your uh, personal care or animal care fellow to that institute, get trained so that you will be well versed with that. You will get it experience so that you will come here and maintain that. 
But veterinary is not, if you do not have the full fledged veterinarian, you can have your local veterinarian to appoint him as a visiting veterinarian. And maybe he can visit weekly once, check all the animals and appoint this the part time. And you pay some honorium, he will come for a weekly visit and check all the animals, your experimental animal. That can be done. Now, this is what we need personal hygiene. Now, it's a very thanks to COVID because now everybody is using mask. Earlier, we, we never bother about it. I have seen a number of animal houses, uh, there is no personal hygiene. The animal care staff are not maintaining the personal cleanliness. This is what I require the personal hygiene. If you have, the, you have a mask and you must have a, a disposable hygiene wear like this, yeah. maybe disposable. And you use this whenever you have the animal facility, you are doing, conducting the experiment, you enter into the animal facility. With this, you must have high standards of personal cleanliness. Special supplies should be provided, shower, because this is the GLP, where if you, before you entering into an animal facility or an animal house, they have the shower like a lift, like thing structure. You just enter automatically, you will be closed, and the shower on, and it showers, it sterilizes your body. And now, after COVID, some of the <coughs> state governments have also started doing the uh, sterilizer showers. You can also have a shower. If you want, you can visit some of the good lab practice. Animal facilities in India, like a uh, Department of Science and Technology sponsored animal facility where you can see the shower. And you have to change the uniform and footwear regularly. This is what requires personal hygiene. Don't worry about that. I don't know. You, if you are doing the animal experiment, if you have an animal facility, please kindly procure. This is very, very important. And you must procure all these personal hygiene material and spend money on that, then you can have a very good results for your experiments. Now this is what you have maintained the vaccine tape. See this is how you maintain the very clearly sanitation is there. This is what you have the racks and the animal cages there. Now we, we have the racks and cages maintaining the rabbits. Now we have the home well maintained. Now coming to the GLP, uh, for example, the guidelines of CPC. What is the feed or the food you have to uh, give it to your laboratory animal experiment? Uh, animals. It should be palatable. Animal should be palatable. It should not be rejected by the, your experiment animal, like your rat. It should be non contaminated. There should be any contaminant. And a nutrition adequate food. The nutrient balance, nutrient diet should be there. And one more thing is formulated feed should be given. Number of companies supplies the formulated feed, like, the, like pellets, formulated pellets like this. And free from chemicals, microbial contamination, and diet free from heavy metals, animal feed, moisture, it contains the food fiber and food protein. If you have any worry about your uh, formulated feed, you can send it to laboratories where we analyze the, uh, the any contaminants, any chemicals are there, and we can check to some laboratories also, good quality laboratories. Now, this is what required the, the quality of the uh, feed, which formulated feed you are going to give it to your laboratory experimental animals. Now, this is what the feed store. You must have a separate small room in order to store your uh, food grains and the other material. This is called the feed store. You have a pellets, you can back stop, so you can maintain here. Now, the bedding is very, very important for your animal facility. Animal, you are maintaining the animal cages. Under that, you have to put a bedding on that. This is called nothing but the animal, the, your uh, paddy husk. And it's easily available in most of the places. You go to any uh, mill, rice mill, you get the waste as very cheap. You can have sacks of this animal husk. Uh, apply on, just put it on the uh, bedding or the bedding on the cages. And if you have the pups, when you have the breeding, when the pups are there, you can have a paper bits, that's the best paper tissue or tissue paper or cotton is the best use of this. Why you are putting the paddy husk? You know that the, it will, the material should remove and replace by, because it can it be clean and dry when you urinate. The animal should be urinate, this should be absorbable. So husk will absorb very well and you can replace every five days once. You replace this husk and put the newer husk and so that your bed will be very clean. And I have seen some of the institute or the animal facility, they have put only once and never remove this, it will spill. A stinky spell will be there. Whenever there's a spill, and maybe maybe stays for four days, and uh, the spell comes, please kindly replace this husk with this so that your animal will be very happy. That's what hygiene of the animal. When you have the 
shops like that, we use our tissue paper or cotton or paper bits. Now the water should be there. Act, continued access to the water is very, very important. Please give the water continuously. Check your water bottles. Clean and monitor your uh, water bottle. I have seen some of the uh, animal facilities where I can see these are green bottles. You know that? They never clean these water bottles. It becomes all dirt will be there and it becomes a very green and sometimes brittle also will be there. So please kindly check your water bottle every day. Check your water quality. Send it to the water quality. You can do it or you can any microbial contaminant or other contaminant, heavy metal contaminant. Check your water. You can have also, you can have the filter water. You can use this, whatever you can do. Aqua dot or whatever it may be, you can do any company. So you can use the for this for portable water, a safe drinking water should be provided. And you can check water devices, drinking tubes, water bottles should be examined regularly. And if there is anything regularly, we just clean it and we sterilize it like autoclave. I told you, we keep it in autoclave and we sterilize them. And the, if you are using for the temperature regulation, if you want the humidity control, you must have an ideometer in your annual facility so that you know. <clears throat> you will maintain that. And very important of uh, the CPC guidelines, the handling is very, very important. That is why I said if you are involved in that, doing the experiment, kindly uh, give training yourself about the handling of the animal. This way yes. you have to handle the rabbit. Excuse me, the sir. Uh, yes. Sir, excuse me. Uh, very interesting session, and I have to stop in between this, sir. Uh, people from uh, YouTube live uh, streaming, they are not able to see your uh, slides, sir, presentation. They are able to hear you, but they are not able to see you, sir. So, they, uh, what you have to do is totally switch off, sir. I mean, come out totally out of the presentation. Uh, stop presenting. And again, you have to uh, start presenting, sir. Uh, some present. One of the participants has now. Okay, shall I resume? Yes, sir. Now you can resume because the live streaming candidates are not able to see your slides, sir. Okay, okay. Yes. Participants, please, do participants, not press please button. don't press a uh, present now button. Some participants are uh, pressing the tab, present now tab. That is the reason we are having this problem. Yeah. Sir, can you please again rejoin? Now you are speaking. PPT is not yet, sir. Please start sharing. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Yes, sir. It is starting, sir. Okay. Now you have to open the PPT, sir. Wait, wait, wait. I go. Where I stop, now I go there. Your screen is shared. And sir, your screen is shared, but your slides are not shared, sir. Please open your PPT. Wait, 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 wait. No? No, sir. Please open your PPT. Please open your PPT, please open your PPT sir. I open. No? No, sir. Only your... Uh, your DP is seen, sir, but the, we can't see the slides. Oh, but yeah, you go back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, uh, stop presenting and go back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh. Sorry for the inconvenience, sir. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, if you want, you have to manage. And my little gem, we gem, we we should tell you about some of the things. No, 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 no,
uh, PPT. Okay. Are you able to see? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It is coming, sir. Uh, oh, yeah. full, uh, just make it full screen, sir. Okay. I can share it. Okay. Is it? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Sorry, sir, for the inconvenience and participants. Sorry for the inconvenience. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. This, this is about the handling. See how handling, you know, a rabbit and a rat, other things. And uh, there are some of the training program. We have the like the models. See, you not have the use the live animal. There have the like we say the mannequins. Uh, this is like a designed uh, animals where we have the you can also uh, handle this animal if the sound will come if you are not handling properly you can get trained yourself now next part of the cpc guidelines is that anesthesia very very important if you are conducting experiment you want to do some of the uh, after the, uh, subjecting them to the drugs subjecting to the, some chemical compound maybe uh, the synthetic or natural compound then if you want to do the Internal part is required. For example, liver, you are conducting some spray or whatever it may be. You must use the appropriate, a proper anesthesia. What are the conditions of giving anesthesia? Having full duration of the experiment. Because if you are not giving full duration, the animal will wake up. Animal will come and it will disturb and you are, it will just realize the pain. So you give you a full duration of the experiment. Animal should not be conscious, very important. They should not perceive the pain. Before anesthesia, we must give overnight fasting like why we do. Suppose you want to go for surgery, the surgeon will advise you to go for a, uh, a fasting previously and we will give also pre anesthetic drug like atropin. You are all very familiar. What are the anesthetic drugs? Inhalants, intravenous, intramuscular drugs you can use. And this what when you want to practice, when you want to give the uh, intravenous, whatever it may be, drug, for example, atropin or your anesthetic drug. These are the models, rat models are available. Just and most of the, I see most of the researchers, those who are involved in the animal experiment, they are not familiar with choosing the right way in order to inject, in order to just administer the drug, so that they have the model, they have the tube like thing. If you inject properly, so the way the water will come out from this tube, this way you familiarize the injecting the drug before you use the live animal. Now, what are the anesthetic drugs they are suggested by the uh, CPC? We have the ketamine, pentobarbitone, sodium thiopentone, urethane. Now, we know that most of the researchers, even the teachers, they use still chloroform. Very pity that. The chloroform is banned. The ether is banned. But in spite of that, I have seen a number of proposals in the uh, research proposals for the animal experiment. For the animal, they use the, they suggest the chloroform administering the drug after the experimental period, maybe 15 days, 20 days, depending on your study, you are maintaining your animal, then you want to have the effect of these drugs on your liver or the some of the organ, you must have a, a humane method of the sacrifice. Don't say killing of the animal. Use the term sacrificing. Human way of sacrificing animal, that is called euthanasia. An animal to be sacrificed on the termination of your experiment. It should be process should be very quick, painless. The death without causing anxiety, pain to the animal. It should not be psychological or disturbances to the animal. Okay, now what are the different euthanasia methods advocated by the uh, CPC? There now it's called the physical method. First one, physical method. We have the cervical dislocation. dislocation. You just hold the animal, the head like this. And you can pull, you also get trained from any uh, animal facilities, cervical dislocation, and you can also inhalation of gases like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, halothane. Now, this is what cervical dislocation is the way you have to put it. Now, this is what carbon dioxide nowadays, most of the animal facilities are using the carbon dioxide. You just, this is a chamber, you have the carbon dioxide cylinder, and put this animal inside that, and you apply carbon dioxide so you can do the euthanasia. Now, what is the euthanasia also, apart from the physical method, you can also admit some of the drugs. You have the barbiturate, chlorohydrate, ketamine, what which are using anesthesia, a small dosage, 
if you have want to have the euthanasia you can give the one three fourths suppose you give five mg you can give the 15 mg for the dose of this uh, your uh, anesthetic drug euthanasia drug now some of the euthanasia methods are not acceptable in some of the annual facilities are experiment earlier also conducted some of the now we are now they follow physical decompression of stunning they are using stunning with the guns that are allowed inhalation is like nitrogen flushing inside the animal organ flushing these are for the uh, larger animals for example you have the uh, x-ray dog and other animals you have the monkeys non human primate involved in the experiment they are doing organ flushing earlier there drug administration nicotine sulfate not allowed magnesium sulfate not allowed paracetamol dichloroacetate potassium chloride these are for the larger animal now nobody is using this now the your uh, cpc guideline says that record keeping is very very important and most of the we are all very good conducting the experiment we are very worse in, very bad or we are not good at making the records uh, the record will speak about the quality of the research all of you must maintain the record whether it's a personal history if you are a college teacher kindly maintain a record a file whatever the file Uh, the circular comes whatever you do the leave letter other thing maintain a copy of that that's called documentation very important documentation and maintaining the record animal house plan is very important if you have a animal facility in your college or any institute animal house staff record how many staff are there health record of the staff breeding stock purchase sales records experiments conducted with number of animal death record clinical records of sick animal training of staff what are the report like this see you have to maintain in east and like this and one like a sasta university they have very good uh, record maintenance like this and ethical consideration what is the ethical means behavior conduct what is right or wrong so research and eth- respond is that ethical toward the experiment animal the scientists must ensure laboratory kept according to guidelines and the welfare very important the animal ethics is very very important so unnecessary suffering on the animals unless a large number of animals should not be exposed to the experiment very very important all the researchers must give priority for the ethical consideration and what is the objective is there is no point in having more groups of animals people say that sir i want to conduct statistics i want to uh, i want to have 100 animals 200 thousand animals why do you want sir in order to get statistically significant result i'm very sorry that i have seen number of proposal research uh, scholars or the researchers require they say that sir we want to have 100 thousand why you want that so generally we get validity you know that's a very sorry you must go through the what is sampling size first check standardize your sampling size whether you require 10 animal 100 animal 50 animal 3 animal the who to recommend for even 3 animal we can get a validated results on that so strictly have the very very important uh, number of groups number of animal we have to choose and standardize it nobody is doing that uh, sir according to this my senior has did previous uh, m uh, m pharma uh, dissertation i have seen that i have seen they have used 100 animals so i am also that is not the uh, justification for your animal use and you kindly do standardize your animal use uh, standard procedure methodology is very very important here and one thing size of the experiment is very important when conduct in vivo test the number of animals used to be test what is size of experiment how many how many times you, what is the requirement of that so for this statistics comes at the statistician for my experience when i am doing my research program in phd program in us at 1970 something i am very sorry to tell you that and uh, when i am doing my programs i just used to conduct all experiment uh, for not on the laboratory animal all on the uh, parasite studies i never thought of concern with statistician but uh, when you go for all this is called to be go at the end before submission when you got analysis uh, data analysis you go to statistician sir i want to do some some statistics he will say the error will come if you do the standard dna standard test or multiple uh, regression test or what a standard uh, test whatever you do that you get lot of problem so kindly consult a statistician for designing your experiment that is very very important i or you go through this and get some statistical training and design your research program then design your number of animal number of samples you require number of times you have to take 10 times or 3 times based on your statistical knowledge and animal ethics you should be human approach strict other code of ethics very important because there is a universal right to life universal right to liberty now ethical principles choosing a proper animal model whether you want to have a rat or uh, sorry sorry a rat or the rabbit whatever it may be you have choose that 
minimum number of animals, but never use the paralytic drugs for surgical restraint. Do not have tissue damaging substances. Avoid, these are not, do not need. So use of the surgical method. No, already Agbosha said, uh, like uh, three as principle, replace, reduce, refine your procedures when you conduct the experiments. Now, very important is the acclimatization. When you have the bringing, you are procuring the extreme animal from outside, from the breeder, directly don't take your expert, conduct experiment. You have a separate room, acclimatize this animal to your environment. So immediately don't take to your lab for experiment. Kindly have a separate room that is called the quarantine facility. Keep it in that. So con uh, the condition of the test facility, certain time, generally not less than seven days. Necessary health check. Check the animal. All health records we have to maintain. And animals not individually and randomize the study like this. We have a quarantine facility. Now, all of you know about quarantine, the containment nowadays, because the after COVID, if anybody has a positive case, you have a quarantine, you have just maintain yourself alive in your house or in a hospital. This is all the quarantine facility. For animals also, we advocate, the CPC advocate, whenever you procure from outside, from the breeder, animal, just maintain it in that, check all the record, whether health record, whether it has a temperature record, whether it has a blood parameter, whether they have any microbial contamination, all the check, only if they free from that, then you can just take it to your animal facility and I know you can conduct the experiment. This is called the quarantine for rabbit. And now I'm going to talk on, the, these are the CPC guidelines, how to have animal facilities there, all the things. Now I'm going to have the regulations, it's very important, the regulations. Now it's very sad, I'm very sorry. The CPC guidelines and regulations are disregarded. They may conduct a number of animal experiments in the laboratory. They never have idea about the CPC guidelines and the regulations. So the animal laws are largely neg neglected. And of course, Agbosha also said that there are a number of legal protection of animals. And these are the, uh, the whereas uh, the legal protection of animals are available, they are not do not aware of existing courts that govern our treatment duty towards animal. And I will just tell you that the ignorance of CPC guidelines, rules, regulations, and other legal issues like the PCA Act, like the SPCA Act, like the Wildlife Protection Act, it is not an excuse for the researcher. Don't say, sir, I am not aware of. Please kindly first, when you do the experiment, when you want to do conduct the experiment, go through the legal issues. Legal. And now, what are the rule ones? So I will say that what are the CP, if you go to the compendium or the CPC uh, rules and regulation, uh, this, you don't worry about it. If you come to the website, you can get, take a printout and go through it. This is called, rule one is called the breeding and experiment animal control supervision of it. This is also amended. See, this has been started in 2001, this rule, and again they amended in 2006. Now, rule two, what is that? They have also defined what's the experiment. You are going to conduct the experiment by using the animals in order to acquire knowledge. What is the knowledge you are going to gain? Biological, psychological, ethological, physical, or chemical nature, use of animals in the production of reagents, and the products such as the antigens, antibodies, Routine diagnosis, this is called preclinical study. Preclinical studies before exposing to the clinical study, before exposing to the volunteers in the mankind or human beings, you are going to conduct in the laboratory animal. And for the purpose of what is the purpose? See, what is the ultimate aim you are conducting is to mean saving or prolonging the life of sufferings or combating the any disease, whether on human beings or animal. Very important. Whether you are going to use this drug for the better use. Maybe with the dog or your cattle, livestock, or human being, this is very, very important preclinical studies. That's called the experiment. They have defined that. Then. Now, rule three, what the rule three says that all the establishment for the north establishment should carry out a business of breeding of animal or trade animal for the purpose of experiment, unless it is registered. So, suppose you want to have a breeding, the, the business, if you want to trade the experiment animal, uh, you must have a registered. So, permission and license from the, the CPC. And now, rule four, housing, studies, trading on, laboratory without approval of CPC is punishable offense. Very important. You can see some of the institutes, what they will do is, without CPC, they will just start doing the experimental animal. That is a very offensive. When you submit the, uh, uh, for example, the MSA dissertation, when you submit the Empowerment dissertation, or whatever the uh, dissertation, now when you go for the Presentation, 
and the company asked to whether you got the clearance from the, the CPC, then you did not. When you for publication also nowadays, if you are not having the approved CPC lab, uh, your paper cannot be published. We have the form A, you can supply, uh, so you can get the form A, form B and part B. Now, rule 5, approval of annual facility by CPC to obtain from the premises they are expected to be conducted. If you have annual facility, apply with the form, using the forms, I already showed you form, get that and send it to the CPC, you get a just registration by the CPC, this is what the CPC get, will give you a registration number. All the animal houses, if you have animal houses, you must display this board, your animal house, which is the address of this college or institute, and registration number of the state issue should be there. Now, every registered establishment or the IAC institute should maintain a list of particulars about the animal use day to day, how many animals, how many rats are used, how many rats are supplied for conducting experiment with the number of species, age, gender, and other relevant documentation. Very, very important like this. Now, this is the form C, you have to fill and do it. And then the form B, requiring acquired experiment to perform, maintain this from right from the beginning. And the committee or any other office authorized made by the committee, like the Institute Animal Ethics Committee, exam the register maintained by you. If you are not, they are not satisfied, they will give you a suggestion first, first step is suggestion. If you are not taking any steps in order to improve, in order to maintain the register, then they will take action on the Institute Animal Ethics Committee. Now, what is the rule? 7G says that detailed specific for housing, feeding, and the maintenance of various species to be used in animal experiment as notified by the committee shall be adhered to the, by the digital establishment. Very, very important. Whatever the suggestion, housing, feeding, and maintenance, like I told you, what is the good formulated feed should be there. Housing should be there. It's a very uh, dust proof or rust proof. Whatever the already I suggested you, it should be how to maintain your other to the rules of the CPC. And the permission of the committee required for conducting experiment. Every register established before acquiring an animal or conducting any experiment, an animal, very, very important. You have to obtain a permission from the committee. What is that committee? This committee is called Institutional Animal Ethics Committee. And uh, some of the researchers also get from some market also. See, in the market, where, where the pet traders, there are also some uh, rabbits, also some rats uh, illegally. And the uh, poor research scholars, without knowing the regulation, they will buy it, do some experiments also. This is also happening in India. This is also very pretty. You should not uh, follow that. You should not do like that. So there should be permission granted by the Institutional Ethics Committee, recognized for the purpose by the committee, along with the detailed content in the specified form. Already told you, there is a form A, form B, part B, you must mention. And member secretary of the committee or the Institutional Ethics Committee, as the case may be. You have to get permission from this Institutional Animal Ethics Committee. Now, what is the, the member secretary of the committee or the Institutional Animal Ethics Committee shall cause you submit the application, the such proposal, number of animals required, the committee, Institutional Animal Ethics Committee, what they will do is they will scrutinize their proposals after submission. If they are satisfied, they grant permission. Some of the those are involved animal experiment, IAC, they are very familiar with the procedure of that. First, you submit the proposal in uh, prescribed format to the committee. They will go through it, all the research color. They grant permission. If they are satisfied, they grant permission. If they are not satisfied, they will invite you for the defending your proposal. They will, in the IAC meeting, they conduct the IAC meeting. So each institute must conduct at least two meetings in a year. And we have regular meetings should be there in that research proposal. They do that. They will discuss that. If there are any clarity queries, they will invite the researcher or the principal investigator to clarify that. If you clarify that, then they will do that. Or in that, they will also update you, suggest you in the midst of meeting that you can also improve your research proposal. In the next meeting, you can submit. Now, the committee or the institute animal ethics committee, as the case may be, they are granting permission for the conduct experiment. Animals are not subject to unnecessary pain or suffering. Very, very, what is, why is there the institute animal ethics committee? In order to supervise, in order to control the laboratory animal experiment, they have the these animals are not subjected to unnecessary pain and the performance of experience on them very important. The committee will look after that. And what is the IAS will do that? Oh, sorry. So the committee, IAC committee of the institute, if they in your college there is IAC, after getting the proposals from the researchers, 
they have to submit to the IAC. They will go through it, and after completing the experiment, what you have to do is you have to also submit the <coughs> the research proposal reports. Regular the periodic report should be submitted to the IAC committee. Very important. Now, already Albert has said, reduce, uh, refine your experiment or replace. Now we have the this called lawyer sentient. Instead of using the various other things, somebody asking some alternative. Now story is coming down. We have the <coughs> nematode, we have the hydra, and Dr. Anpasha Lab has done a very good work on hydra, and also in Pune, Dr. Suresh is doing a very good hydra work. We have the fruit fly. Now the zebra fish is coming very good. Animals lowest on the phylogenetic scale, which may give scientifically valid results, should be first considered for any experiment. Don't worry about it. You have to only with the, uh, the rat or rabbit. You can go for these animals also. And very important, already I told you that the experiment should be designed using minimum number of animals to give statistically valid results. Very important. <clears throat> that is why I told that you have to conduct, you have to consult the statistician before you design your experiment. And uh, all of you must know that the up and down method, where earlier for the toxic studies we used to kill hundred animals, even thousand animals for experiment. Now with this five animals also, you can do up and down. You get a for toxic study, you can get a validated results. Now already Agnesh has said that. Uh, what is it? They have the uh, replacement alternative to encourage justification for required or use of animal not only. For example, they are also doing for the uh, your uh, cosmetic. Now you cannot use the animal for cosmetic testing. You can use the other alternative like this, a uh, skin irritating test, or you have the as they do that and do the cell culture method. But the rule nine says that the provision makes the person using animals expert responsible for their welfare. Often very very important. Rehabilitation is very very important. You are conducting is somebody is also addressed like what they will do. Say what to do. You you just procure the rabbit animal. You make use of them. You conduct experiment. If you are not like, conducting the sacrificing or euthanasia experiment, you are have to maintain. Suppose you are giving some drug. For example, you give curcumin. You are giving paracetamol. So that you just do the experiment. <coughs> you take your sample. <coughs> you you do all the biochemical parameters. Then what you do with animal? You cannot throw the animal. Live animal, you have to maintain. That's called rehabilitation program. Whether your established can do that maintaining in your budget, you can also have some budget for maintaining a lifetime. That is called the rehabilitation, like pensioners, like uh, the uh, refugees. You have to maintain them till their death. That is what very very important. In case if you have no provision, there are some licensed people like. A welfare organization like Blue Cross Society of India or the People for Animal. There are a number of the NGOs are there. We can just contact them. We can just transfer this for the after rehabilitation by having the legal procedures. And what is nine F? This is what euthanasia very important. You, you can just what is the based on euthanasia? What is the euthanasia? When the animal faces recurring pain, suffering, non-termination of the life of the equal animal would be life-threatening to. Of humans or other animal. Suppose you are giving euthanasia method. Only to do physical methods, whatever it may be, like your ether. When you pour ether, what is the result? You just study them. When you pour ether, it, 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 they feel the pain, and you can also we will also feel very bad about it. But the, the, the humans also threatened by it. The researcher himself is threatened when you do the some of the euthanasia method and see that you are choosing the appropriate euthanasia method by which you are not the researcher has not committed. The animal is not present. That's what the rule nine F F says. That what is rule nine I? Actions are performed in every case under the supervision of person duly qualified. It's very very important. A degree holder in, in medicine or a veterinary science, a postgraduate above in life sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, any other natural sciences, degree or diploma holder in pharmacy, diploma certificate in laboratory animal, technical science from recipient institute as identified. CPC for purpose of and under the response of person. That's right. See, you must have a trained person. That's what we wanted. And even the medicine director said he must have handled the animal during his career. Then only he is eligible for this. So rule nine one say CPC guideline very well. The experiment shall be performed in the presence of the qualified persons. <clears throat> Now, if you want to transfer the acquisition animal for experiment. The breeders shall not transfer any animal by sale otherwise to establishment which is not registered under this rule. Suppose you approach a breeder, you must go to a breeder, a registered breeder, and registered by the CPC. 
Suppose your your college wants to get some animals for the register breeder. The register breeder should not supply or procure animals if you are not registered in CPC. Very important. So they will ask where is your register license. You we'll give a register number. So if you go to breeder, you should have the register number so that I request you. If you are not doing that, go to the CPC, apply to the CPC, get your registration number. Then only the breeder will supply you animal. Every establishment of acquisition of an animal. Animals are not transferred. You cannot transfer the animals by sale. Suppose you put two hundred animals, you have collected some animals, rats, hundred animals are there in stock. You have finished your experiment. Then you should not transfer to any institute. You should not transfer, or you cannot sell it for any other purpose except a registered breeder or established breeder. Sometimes you can transfer after collecting. For example, the parrots are not dry after one week, ten days. Nothing will make the animal become normal. Then you can. In the IAC, they get the permission to transfer, to give it to the some institute or some breeder. Now, what is the rule? Can you can establish and acquire animals for experience from registered breeder only? Already told you. And what is rule? Can be this amendment allows the establishment to put the animal from any other legal source in case of non-available with registered breeder. In case if you are not have registered breeder, that time is not available. There are some availability of the you can justify it. By producing documentation, legality of the procedure, we can also procure from them. What is ten E says that provision allows the establishment to import genetically modified animals. Nowadays, you defy uh, the procure genetically uh, modified or genetically modified rats. Like example, you, you have a uh, black rat, the black mouse, conducting uh, whatever the other whatever the skin problem. They bring the from the farm. For that, you have to get permission from the DGFT. Director General of Foreign Trade. In case such animals are not available within registered breeder, and we also do justify that the genetically modified animals are not available in India, and give the uh, justification, get the permission from Director of General uh, Foreign Trade. Now, what is the rule? Ten days. The animals used for experiment in the production of breed improvement program may be given out by the breeder institute for domestic use. No animals shall be imported by a breeder. Or any estate which is available in the country, already told you, the breeder or estate shall comply with the direction given by the committee for the purpose of control. So, so then and there they give the, the uh, guidelines to the breeder or the estate to the IAC for this purpose. So, recaps very important. The rule seven says that every estate or institution animal estate committee shall maintain a record of the animals under its control under custody in this special format. Every estate or institution animal estate committee shall permit. Such information as the committee may be done. So you have to maintain the document. For example, if you have what is the scenario of twenty or twenty, what are the records? What is the animal record? What is the death record? What is the feed record? Stock record? Everything. Where you took it? What is the stock? Or what are the animals used for? Number of animals for collection. You have to maintain all the record. You have to submit whenever the IAS institute animal committee requires. All laboratories shall inform the exact number, which animal to the member secretary or any other officer. See this is what I require. Suppose you use hundred animal, do the realistic picture. As uh, submit to the IAC, whatever animals use. So record keeping, archiving is very important. IAC should maintain. This is the duty of the institute animal ethics committee. It is not a committee. Committee has to have a curriculum meeting of all the members, IAC members, training programs by attended by the animal ethics attended. Copy all the study protocol. You have to maintain all the research proposals, minutes of all the meeting. Copy of the existing relevant national international guidelines. So you have to maintain the guideline. The college, the IAC has to maintain and shall be maintained by IAC. Copy of all the current with the numbers, researchers, and other regulatory bodies should be maintained by IAC. Uh, project completion project, the project complete project report should be approved or the approved project should be submitted or maintained. Records of breeding of animals, supply etc. If breeding of animals undertaken shall be maintained by IAC. Uh, some of the IAS also allowed for breeding purpose for their usage allowed by permission, and you can also maintain the record. Records of import of animals you have to maintain. Contract research. So what is the contract research? Suppose you have a tie-up with the industry. For example, Tabet India. When a company wants to do test some uh, drug, they will also approach you. You can also this is called contract between the institution, institution and an industry. A tie-up between the industry and the institution is called a contract research, and on the institute. They are shall be maintained by the IAC. Uh, records of rehabilitation. So, what is the rehabilitation program you have conducted? Whether you have transferred any animal to that, you have to maintain. 
this also required for the large and like dog uh, other animals uh, or the and all dog should be archived for period of prescribed so whenever you want you can you have a storage in the covered is digitize it store it that whenever you require that we maintain it and rule two says that no establishment to undertake contract research audit to do contract research no establishment contract or undertake to perform contract research or expend on contract basis on behalf of any other establishment research which you should accept with prior permit suppose so, now this very very now the business is that also you register for conducting experiment the phd scholar Uh, they don't have any university in their college or in university. What they will do nowadays? They go to outsourcing. They go to some institute and they will say that sir, I want to do some uh, experiment on the curcumin. Uh, I have this one sample. I will give you this one. So they will give drug or uh, some chemical. The outsourcing will do that. So don't do that. So your proposal will be submitted to that institute. They have to get permission. Otherwise, you know the research proposal tomorrow you will be feeling very bad. Your, when your PhD submit, you have to uh, enclose your uh, permitted uh, IAC permitted uh, granted uh, document should be in there. So, except with the prior permission of the committee, provide that no such restrictions are applied to collaboration set between academic institution. Very important. So, when you have a collaboration set between one, is, suppose you are going to some university, get a contract, get a research between the two institute, get a clearance from the IAC, and then only it's very validity. And for that purpose. All the researchers, scientists must should aware use of experiment animal research must be first reviewed by and approved by the institute and this committee. But that is why we have the rules that IAC should be there for all the institute. Such reviews essential to determine whether use of experiment animal justified scientifically and ethically. Now, all of you must also read the CPC the SOP standard operating procedure. You can download and do it. And Rule 13 says institutional limits. Now I'm coming to the uh, somebody has addressed to Adarsha. What is the IAC? Means it's a body of. I can take five ten minutes within that I complete very quickly. Uh, means a body comprising a group of person recognized and registered. See uh, what is that by the committee for the purpose of control over an experiment. In an establishment which is constituted and operated in accordance with the procedure, especially for the purpose of the committee. So IAC. What is IAC? Now what is the guidelines? As per the 13 rule, all the IAC should have what are the members constituted of the IAC? One biology scientist from your institute, maybe from zoology, botany, or biochemistry. Two scientists from uh, from the zoology. Suppose you have a zoology department having the IAC or animal facility, you can have one scientist from your department. Two sent from different biological. Department. For example, you can invite biochemistry or some uh, the biotechnology department or so in your institute. One veterinarian in one the care of animal. You have to invite the veterinarian, veterinary doctor. One scientist in charge of animal facility, and chair person of the committee, member secretary should be nominated by from the above five. You can nominate or some of the institute what they want to have the director of the institute, the dean of the uh, science department, or the principal of the college or dean. You can also have the sixth member. It's allowed. But uh, veterinary is very very important. The veterinarian should be qualified veterinarian. And you can also have a part-time veterinary invite them. Now, what is the minimum qualification for this IAC member? BBSC or MSc Zoology, Animal Science, Animal Biotechnology, or MSc MTech, Life Science, Biological Sciences, Biochemistry, Biotechnology, Biomedical Engineering, M Pharma with experience in animal handling, MD MS in the medical field. Uh, after MBBS, you have the MD and laboratory animal handling. Now, in addition to that, we have the five. IAC of your institute can nominate five members, suggest five members, send it to the IAC Minister of Environment at New Delhi, get their approval. In addition to that, for your institute, the CPC will nominate. That is called CPC nomination, like a main nominee. That's why we have work class a, a CPC main nominee and link nominee. What is link nominee? Suppose the main nominee is not available. Suppose I am not available for that meeting. Now we can invite the link nominee. One main nominee, link nominee, a scientist from the outside institute. For example, your Arco Valley College have the animal facility. They may invite from Hyderabad, uh, maybe uh, Usmania University, one scientist from there, and there is socially aware nominee. That means you are this animal welfarer, maybe from People for Animal, Blue Cross Society of India. They are all socially aware of nominee. Also, so totally we have five. 
plus two. They have seven numbers and already qualified for the CPC nominee. Same thing. Now, IAC reviewed approved all type of protocols. They have to on the animal experiment. They have to monitor IAC has to monitor throughout the study and ensure the IAC committee will visit the animal house facility regularly. And the committee has to ensure compliance with the all regulatory code. So this committee takes all the responsibility to have the control and supervision of the animal as suggested by the CPC. And the review procedure, we have to conduct the meeting, hold the meeting at regular intervals. Proposal should be scrutinized. Uh, proposal not at the meeting. Do the meeting, you should not go through proposal. So I request the IAC chairman to send it at least four times. Prior to the meeting, 15 days meeting to the member, the member should go through all the proposals and the decision will be taken in the discussions. If all the clearance is given, then it will be approved and everybody has to approve, all the members should approve their proposals. And in case if it's not approved, there is some <clears throat> decision note, then again the researcher will ask to submit it again. If they're not satisfied, they can also send it to the uh, CPC uh, New Delhi. So, researcher will be invited to offer clarification if needed. So, what I do, I get to the proposal from the IAC. Then I will go through all the proposal. If I am satisfied, if the other members are satisfied, no, we don't have any clear. We are very clear. The research proposal is very clear. So, the researcher need not attend. Different, they need not give you uh, the permission for, to conduct the uh, research program. In case, if you want any clarification, we invite them to present, as a, like you go for viva or a presentation of your uh, synopsis or other thing. We do that. So the decision of the IAC will be minuted. So you have the minutes of it, you have to record, and chairperson of course shall be taken in writing with the signature of all the IAC member. So then and then you have the minutes of meeting, all these proposals are uh, uh, approved. Then there is no approval of the uh, number one, number 21, 25, not approved because the research proposal is not approved. That the animal justice was not given. So again, we submit the submission of that for the next meeting. Now, rule 14 says that in case of a major violation, the CPC may be written order, suspend or remove the registration of a staff. Suppose the registration, the registered society or the IAC is not following any rules or any regulations, the closure of the animal house will be due, this will be done after giving the establishment or bailer an opportunity. And some of the, suppose the IAC member, the IAC committee says that the, the animal facility is not up to the mark. So, or even of suggestion, they are to, there are a number of animal species are closed. Now, now, when you go through the all the guidelines of the CPC, if you are very familiar with the CPC rules, with all the animal protection laws, the researcher must go through all these things, literature search should be there. Then, I have seen a number of research proposals, research scholars are very worried, oh, my proposal is killing. I am worried about my proposal submitted to the IAC. I mean, they become very restless, tense, tense when they come for me. No. If you want to tension free, free from all that, update the CPC guidelines and amendments and careful thought and preparation and presentation. Very important. So we are lacking in that. All the research called the literature service nowadays very, very bad. When they say that I have given on the internet, all of they will say that internet. You go through very literature sir. literature survey is very, very important. Go through the, all the legality of the procedures, go to the legal protection of the animals, go to the all the CPC guidelines first. I can compare here. You go to the CPC guidelines, the website, uh, print the, take the, download it, take the printout, read line by line, within words, you do the rules and regulation, and if you done, you have a very good research purpose based on that. So it won't kill you, it won't worry you, so you won't be panicked. So you update it. You have a careful part, preparation presentation, you can prepare a successful proposal, then you get a very good clearance on the IAC. <coughs> so, thank you very much for having uh, given an opportunity. So, I request all the business scholars to give priority to go through the CPC guidelines and uh, rules, even the investigators. So, the college teachers, they also submit their business proposals for the DF for funding, DST, UGC, and see all the rules and regulations fulfill that then to become a very good proposal, then you have a very good conducting the research programs on the laboratory experiment, that means you are doing a very good research, your results are very good, the accountability is very good, and then what is the purpose of this? Ultimately, your the ultimate aim should be for the betterment, for the welfare of the human kind, we are doing it, not merely for getting the PhD, getting the your 
uh, MSC dissertation or no, or getting one art, research article, no, or the uh, research paper. See that you are doing a very good conducting with all the ethics are following and doing a very good work and that will be very good for you. Thank you very much for having given the opportunity to share with you uh, in the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I am Dr. Bharati, uh, who introduced you, sir. Yes, uh, sir, Satyam Naranapgaru, uh, your extensive information about animal experiments, regulations and the guidelines uh, uh, is really very important for all the lecturers, all the participants, sir, and all are excited. So many messages are coming, sir. This information is really important and the kind of messages we are getting. And also, many of uh, the lecturers require the PPT given by you because those rules and regulations uh, we cannot note down immediately. Please kindly share your PPT with our organizers if possible later. Uh, so one, when you have so one thing, madam. One, one minute, madam. Excuse me. Check. Yes, okay, all these things like other people, you just go to CPC website. You can download okay. anyway. I have already got it. There you can also share it. No problem. So it is not available very rarely. Sure, sir. Ex excellent uh, talk. Uh, we are fortunate to listen to this. And sir, uh, some questions, my dear uh, participants. Can you interact with sir? Uh, any questions, queries? In fact, I have uh, some queries here, sir. Can I read out? Yes. Uh, one of the participants have uh, written that in COVID situation, if any animal is used to uh, try the drug and if the animal is dead, then is there any punishment because the animal earlier not contained the disease but it exposed it to the disease during testing? It is a uh, participant's uh, doubt, sir. Yeah. No, this, this is actually that, that's what I told you. Yes. See, when, 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 when we have we have regular microbial contaminant testing. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I said. See, how do you this is where it comes? That means you, you are contaminated your animal testing. That means you are you, you are not hygienic condition. Yes. Now, how did this come? What diseases? Have you have you have you sent it to any like for example it's a viral disease, have you sent it to any viral stroke? How can you say something? How can you know that is a disease? Maybe you are not maintained very well, or the drug you have administered may have a side effect. The dosage may be more. Yes. See, yes. the dead animal, see, this stuff, see, you have to be big, very, very cautious on that. Then, what is it? See, when there is a dead, why do you have to raise an option? Suppose you are taking 100 animals, there are 10 dead animals. For the IAC, when you give report, progress report, why you have 10? Then you have to justify it. So, 10 animals died when you are conducting experiment. So I need 10 more animals in the next meeting, yeah. So I, I have seen that. So you know, there is a comes casual. See, there are happens. Some casual. Don't worry about it. Why you have to reason out, justify it. Go to the literature survey. Why it has done when I conduct experiment? Maybe, maybe due to that, sir. I am not sure that. Kindly, I have done with the only 70 animals. The 20 animals during that there's something happened. And you have justified it. In the next thing I have given permission. Next meeting, we want to have that 20 animal. So when you justify, so don't say immediately uh, disease. What disease? What is that? Then I will ask. Then that means uh, you are also free from disease. How come? When the animal is contaminated, you are not contaminated as such. So that means you are not keeping hygiene. So that's what I said. Very very careful about it. Yes. Yes. Maintaining the lab in a clean condition. Next. Anybody, please. Uh, I have a question. I have a question, sir. Uh, I have a question. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. I am Dr. Brahmachari. Uh, can, can, can you hear me, sir? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, your voice is clear. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. I am Dr. Brahmachari. I am specially trained in animal training in uh, Indian Institute of Science Sciences, IASC Bangalore, and uh, University of Queensland, Australia. Um, I, I worked in uh, wonderful laboratories for, for, for all the animal training. Yeah. But uh, very pathetic okay. to know uh, in all the pharmacy colleges across uh, in India, okay, all the colleges are having uh, farm, uh, all the colleges are having the uh, Animal houses, but uh, they do not have ethical uh, committee clearance. So this is one thing. And uh, after having worked in, in the university, I have a small question, sir. Sir, uh, suppose if our university does not have an anim animal committee, if my experiment has to be included in uh, the in, in in the college where the, it has an animal committee, then what has to be done? Sir? 
Yeah, will include my experiment yeah. there. Yeah, so this is called the website you know, collaborative research between the institutes. Suppose you are from the university or some college, this is called a contract research. A contract between an institute and institute that is in submit all the proposals. So there is a the co investigator, like a, uh, like a, uh, like a supervisor, no? there are supervisor. Okay, should, 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 should there be a research project between both institutes? Uh, uh, no. Is it a mandatory one? Yeah, so suppose if you are from the college, for example, yeah. you, you yeah. are from the university yeah. college. Yeah, I do not have a research project. You are lecturer from the college? Yes. I am a professor in the university. Yeah, suppose, suppose, suppose if you, okay, you, you want to have to yeah. conduct an experiment, some animal, what you can do is, yeah. you can contact yeah. where it is IAS. For example, for maybe university, some college, some institute, they have IAS, right? Okay. Yeah. So there, contact some scientist there, okay. those are conducting the experiment, you have a tie up with them. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Your proposal should be submitted to them, to that IAS. Okay. Okay. You get a permission. Okay. You get the contact research, they will give you all the permission. So then that can be conducted. It's called contact research. Okay. Are you clear? Yeah. Yes, sir. But yet, uh, and that, yeah, should there be a research project between both of them, or uh, is it okay if they have MOU? Is it? No, no, no. This is on internet. MOU is on internet. This is between the same one. Okay. There is uh, some rules and regulations of the institute. They come back to say MOU and other things. That is, we have to describe that. So, the CPP says that we are not part yes, of yes, one, one, more small, okay, uh, one more small question, sir. Uh, suppose uh, I do I do an experiment uh, personally, and I keep your institutional ethical committee in my publication. If there is an inquiry or if there is something, so will will there uh, such yeah. a question be cancelled? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. See, you are not allowed to conduct in your premises. That's what rule says, you know. Premises yeah, you definitely. cannot come. You cannot how can you carry? Let's carry. Yeah. I mean, so only in the other institute can be carried. You can go there and do it experiment alone. Yeah, but you cannot conduct in India. Uh, because in India, most of the research papers are, uh, are showing anonymous institutional ethical committee clearance numbers. Okay, mm -hmm. all the manuscripts are kept cleared and passed. So this is the major drawback in India. So it, I would like to you know, place this on your record. So that. No, th th this is what say that, that, that you are right. That is why I am conducting awareness program. See, why this today's lecture is that because yeah. most of them they are not aware. I know the publication, you know, no condition is there whether it should be justified. Whether it has been cleared in the institution I made this committee. Even for the mm. BSC, UGC, if you have any funding, you know that? No. Yeah. Without clearing the IAC, you cannot get the funds. Okay. If the UGC, you must send the proposal to the UGC to get a grants. And even mm. after that, sanction based condition is that you have to get clearance from the institution I this committee. First, you have to get the institution I this committee, and then only you will be approved. See, these are the conditions. So we do not see doing a pharmacy college animal research are there. See, those are the days. Now it's slowly improved. See, after the CPC of IAC and all, slowly we are coming. See, see, see we cannot just have all the CPC, like we have seen, number of, I have seen number of uh, the uh, GLP laboratories, like RK, the, the number of GLP. So we cannot, whatever the college is, you go to the rules and regulation and then do that. So these are things. See, don't, see, these are, see that's what I said now. When the profession comes, Ignorance of the law, rules and regulations do not and exclude. Suppose okay. somebody does that, well, you have to be answerable. You don't say something. Every, suppose they said that fellow has taken uh, 10 grams or 10 uh, pounds of jewels, why not I? <laughs> is there a legality of that? So yes, that is not a legal. Yes, will, 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 will the CPCA come to the institutes for regular checkups whether you have or you are maintaining the uh, lab, animal laboratories uh, properly or not? Yes, I go, no, regularly I go, legally I go to the animal facility, I conduct that, I take photograph of that, all those things we do it. Otherwise, see, how, see, we, get, we have sent reports to the uh, CPC, yeah, so Chennai office and uh, Delhi office, so what is the scenario of that, whether they have good feed, if not, then we use suggestions. We have also post, we also post animal facility. This also happened. Some of the animal facilities are also post. The registration has been cancelled, not has been renewed. See, don't think like that. See, you have to see the, the, all the things. It's a very big issue in India, and we have to go slowly. And now we have it coming up very good, very good in animal facilities, in pharmacy, other things. 
there are negative points also they are positive what my idea is please kindly uh, be optimistic that follow the rules and regulation here of at least from today onwards for the welfare of the animal for the welfare of the research and for the welfare of the animal kind don't say that this institute are not don't do that you follow that you follow this rules and regulation that's what i wanted don't give a, a model for other things it is a very negative approach should not be there are you clear hello ah tell me yes sir uh yes sir uh, brahmachari uh, i think sir must have left now ah he is still online sir chari uh, garu uh, your uh, doubt is clear brahmachari garu chapandi are you there <laughs> yes sir yeah. one more one more thing sir uh, from uh, dev narayan roy from west bengal uh, he yeah, he has mentioned one uh, query that uh, he, first of all he was uh, very much uh, enlightened with your presentation sir and then he wrote yeah, are there any specific guidelines for establishing iaec yeah. in government college yeah. sir can you provide yeah. any website link in this regard See, yes, I already told in the beginning itself. Just yeah. type it in the your website. C P C A, C P C A C A. Just put C P C. You can just click it. You get the, all the C P C guidance from the rules and regulations. Everything like I said, compared with yes, sir. Actually, in the first slide itself, it was given. Yes, sir. Right, sir. Right. Thanks, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. And Rupamani uh, Madam uh, is having some questions from uh, YouTube stream. Uh, Madam, please uh, take over the chat. Yes, sir. As we are running uh, uh, short of time, uh, so I will quickly ask two questions uh, from YouTube live streaming, sir. Uh, Chiranjit Nath he wants to know whether uh, ether can be used as anesthetic drug, and does it cause any stress, and does it hamper the results? Which which one, Chandra? Ether, ether. You no, know, ether is banned. Banned. Yeah. See, I have seen a very pretty. I have seen number of papers of researcher writing uh, by uh, 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 anesthesia drug by using the uh, your uh, ether as anesthetic drug. No, I never allowed. I say researcher. I have gone through literature. When a proposal comes, no clarification. I used to ask. Uh, you are a researcher. When you are registered for PhD, two years. Have you completed methodology? Oh, ether. Oh, very good. It has banned for information. Go to the literature. See that's why literature such is very poor. Very sad. Because such is still they're using even pharmacy colleges also. Here yeah, they're now even from here they're here they're here they're here because my senior is used. What they do? Cut and paste. You see all the form. Whatever dissertation, sir. Previous my senior PhD scholar, my senior use here. So I also use. <laughs> there is no refinement. So very sad that here they can ban for information. How can you use now? Clear? Okay, sir. uh there is another query from sunanda uh, she wants to know uh, if we use the anesthetic drugs which you have mentioned for different animals for lab experiments then how do we determine the exact dose of this drug ah uh, see that's what again you say uh, i mean uh, you are a phd scholar or mp scholar then see what she no no wait wait so, no idea sir then, uh, uh, that's what again researcher when you see instead of putting like What is the drug I want? Okay, I told you honestly, drug. Okay, fine. Like ketamine. The dosage. What is again literature? Whether you are going to write or not. If I say one mg, so tomorrow say one six piece of amla sakra for satya na told one mg to be. That is which animal? Rabbit? Are you goat? Are you poultry? Farm animal? A dog? So you go to literature depending on rat or mouse, the mice. You are going to do that. What is the dosage they have prescribed that? One. What is the dosage you have to do for animal? So you have to go to the literature and design standardize. You go for for ten animals, which is the best for anesthesia drug. And now in India we are not following the standardization of our research procedure. Immediately you want to take a sample, drug it, and do that. No, that is not the way. Standardize your anesthesia drug. You have to standardize it. So go to the literature. What is the drug you dosage? You have prescribed dosage and follow it. Okay. So that's what I want as food feed. Everybody says, "For this I want one mg." You tell me that's all. No, no. You have to do as a researcher. Go through that, standardize it. Then you get a very good research. Okay, fine. You can understand that. You can also. Hello. Hello. So thank you very much. Uh, since we are running uh, short of time, uh, I'm I'm going to share sir's email ID 
uh, in the chat box so that if anyone has any more queries they can please contact sir on his email yeah. and get all your queries clarified yeah you can just put sir, my email yes, sir. yes i will be forwarding yes sir so it was yeah, a very yes sir so it was an excellent um, uh, talk sir with lots and lots of information and more and more questions are pouring in sir but uh, i'm sorry we won't be able to attend that and uh, they will be interacting with you directly on email sir thank you so much for being a part of today's uh, webinar sir thank you so much i take this opportunity to sincere gratitude to the principal the management and the department as well for excellent excellent you know very much especially david has used to approach me for whenever he wanted and then you used to is very fun sir i want to so you want to do this sir <laughs> I one of Simon. Again, he said you could also want it. So this, this is the way the department is going. So I am very happy that the department is going everywhere. That, that is what they, that is, uh, any committee comes here in my car when I am doing my as a lecturer there. The NAC committee says that we have a strongest zoology department. And now also I am very happy that we have a strong, strongest zoology department in this college. I am very happy. I wish you a good luck. And principal support is all for all the care. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Now today's third uh, speaker is ready. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to one and all. A hearty welcome to all the participants for this international webinar. I am Dr. P. R. Vani, Assistant Professor in Geology, Dr. B. S. Krishna, Government Degree College, Vishakhapatnam. Uh, I am privileged to introduce another eminent speaker, Dr. P. Uma Devi. Dr. P. Uma Devi is from University of Virginia, USA. She has done her master's in biochemistry from Andhra University and PhD in computational biology from Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics, CDFD. She has qualified great CSI net. Her research interest includes human genetic variation and disease, cancer genomics, rare disease research, transcriptomics, microbiome analysis, tool development for genomic research, as well as developing pipelines for genomic research, machine learning approaches for data analysis, translational research and application of genomics to patient care. Dr. Uma has 18 years of research experience, which includes as a research associate, Center for Public Health Genomics, University of Virginia, USA, from 2011 to 17. Thereafter, as a research instructor, Public Health Science, University of Virginia, USA. Presently, she holds the position of research instructor, Department of Hematology and Oncology, University of Virginia, USA. Dr. Uma has a number of honors and awards to her credit, which includes, just to name a few, the Vesna and Slobodan Todorovic Prize for the Outstanding Research Presentation, University of Virginia, Department of Anesthesiology. She had been shortlisted for BioAsia 2009 Young Scientist Award for her innovative work. She also worked as a teaching assistant at the Mendelian Data Analysis Workshop University of Washington and Center for Mendelian Genomics, Seattle, Washington. She is a reviewer for international journals like Bioinformatics and Genomics. Uh, Dr. Uma skills in programming languages like Python, Perl, AWK, SQL, R, shell scripting, and Unix system administration. Dr. Uma has presented her research work in several international conferences in India, Toronto, Boston, and Virginia. She has 11 publications to her credit in high impact factor international journals like Nucleic Acid Research, BMC Genomics, PLIS Computational Biology, Cell Death and Disease, International Journal of Radiation, Oncology, Biology, and Physics, so on. She also has authored some book chapters. Some of her major contributions to science includes Genomic Landscape of Rare Form of Leukemia, Impact of Inflammation on Subcellular Energetics under uh, Different Anesthetics, Identification of Gene Mutation Associated with Radio Sensitivity, Studies on Amino Acid Substitution in Plasmodium Falciparum. 
one of our major contribution is the development of useful genomic tool gemini so with this short introduction i present before you the third eminent speaker who is going to talk about genomics genetic variation and human diseases so over to you dr uma thank you so much uh, for the very elaborate uh, introduction um, and it's a great privilege today to be talking to all of you and while i was preparing the slides i i want to share one thought which i had <clears throat> it was not easy to present every idea for for a person who is not introduced to this field and i think you all are doing a great job as lecturers training the young minds so hats off to you all um so uh, if collaborators can just let me know if they can see the slides i'll move forward hello can you hear uh, us uh, someone else is in the presentation mode let me check once okay please carry on can you hear no. me yes yes you are audible and you, you can see my powerpoint no not yet oh please give me a moment uh oh. Are you? I think the receiver presentation is coming by my. Okay, sir. That's the reason. Yes, sir. Sir, please can you? Uh, yes, now it's. Yeah, I, I, I post. Yeah, I post everything. That's why. Can you see now? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Now okay. it's visible. Okay, great. Uh, so today, uh, I would be uh, talking on genomics, genetic variation, and human disease. um uh, i had experience in this field for a couple of years now and uh, i'll try my best to present some of the concepts in this field and i am hoping many of you who are uh, not uh, very very much into this field will have some interest uh, after listening to this talk uh before i move ahead with this uh topic i would like to introduce bioinformatics because everything starts from there uh, this is a, a word cloud this is known as a word cloud i'm not sure how many people are aware but i'll just explain uh this is one of the tool which i use to uh produces image and i can call this as a bioinformatics tool because uh what it does is you can give a pdf file uh it can be anything here i had given a bioinformatics review article and i ask uh count how many times you see one particular word in the article and as per the frequency of that word give me a plot so what you see here is the words which are in uh which which are larger are those which are frequently found in that text so this is a good representation of bioinformatics i think like what you see is computational uh software dna sequence protein informatics structure databases and this is all what bioinformatics is so uh i would put bioinformatics as an interdisciplinary field where a knowledge of biology uh comes together with that of statistics and computer science um uh, this is also maybe referred as computational biology people use different terminology of uh, their one and the same and broadly i can put bioinformatics as data analysis where you have raw data and then when i say raw data this is data on the computer uh you can analyze the data using different tools and draw some conclusions from the data and as such as you see analysis needs some tools software development becomes an important component as well uh, where a lot of tools are used for the analysis of the data the next is modeling modeling also comes under bioinformatics this can be different kinds of modeling in the present world uh, data science is a emerging field 
and lot of machine learning techniques which are computerized algor algorithms uh, which model the data and try to get some pattern out of the data is also a modeling. Uh, modeling requires the knowledge of math, sometimes chemistry and physics as well. Uh, for example, if we do molecular modeling, uh, which is uh, used in drug designing, this is a good example where you are using the knowledge of uh, chemistry. Uh, the below is an example here, uh, which I have taken from a publication, where they're sho showing docking. Uh, docking is, uh, they try to uh, see the best spatial representation of a molecule, uh, which gives the maximum stability for the molecule. And this is, uh, this, this part is uh, the enzyme MMP13, which is a very attractive drug target for osteoarthritis. And here in green, they show a inhibitor. And this particular structure, which they show here, is the best structure in 3D space where there is a good fit of the inhibitor with that target molecule. Uh, this is an example of modeling. And all this requires the knowledge of computers, use of computer, as well as knowledge of physics and chemistry. So I'm going to introduce some concepts which are covered under bioinformatics. One is the sequence alignments. Now, what are sequence alignments? Uh, there are a lot of databases out there where uh, people deposit sequences, and these sequences are either DNA sequences or protein sequences. Uh, which people have either experimented with or it is an outcome of some annotation process. Now, sequence alignments is just matching two sequences to see how similar they are and to identify regions of similarity. This process requires dynamic programming methods, which is again computer science. These are algorithms which help you align or match these two sequences. And there are a couple of tools out there which have been developed in the process to do these alignments. And how do they do that? They use something like a scoring table. Here I have shown an example of a protein to protein alignment where you have an amino acid substitution score table. And every value in here will tell you that if you meet a sequence where there is N to A, mismatch, then you have to add minus 2 to the alignment score. And if there is a match, there is a positive score. So which clearly means that as and how you encounter more and more matches, the score of your alignment will keep increasing, and that will give an optimal alignment. So uh, also, there are possibilities that during alignment, you might have to introduce some gaps like in here. Uh, and the algorithm decides to do that only when it thinks that there are more matches by introducing these gaps here. As you see in this example, for example, D to D alignment represented by a double dot is a match. And if you go back to this table, the value is 7, so 7 goes into the alignment scoring. Then the same you will do for each and every base in here. And for a mismatch, which is represented by a single dot here, N to A, so you will go back to the scoring table and add minus 2. And so on, you will go ahead with the, or the algorithm will go ahead with the alignment. When you have gaps, we introduce some penalties, which the pro program does, and which means gap is not something which you would encourage in an alignment. So the dynamic programming actually goes through each and every possibility of an alignment, and then it will calculate which is the most optimal one, and that is reported as the final alignment. So why are these alignments useful? Many a times when you have a sequence which is well characterized, meaning to say 
you know what part of the protein sequence has important function. Uh, that knowledge is sometimes useful when you align an unknown sequence to it to see if there are regions of strong similarity with a known region of good function, I mean functional region. So this is an example of a protein sequence, for example, which is 600 amino acids long. And these are the domains. Domains are functional units of the protein. Uh, this is a kinase domain. And there are other domains, and each domain has its own function. And alignment of an unknown with strong similarity around these regions will give you some idea about the unknown sequence. So why do we have to compare sequences? I had already talked about it. Uh, we want to know the function. Uh, the best way is if from the sequence for the particular protein, if you know the structure, that's the best way to deduce its function. Because once you have a 3D structure of the protein, you are aware of the different regions of the protein which might have funct functional importance and those regions which are not that important. You have an idea from the PD, uh, PD, uh, crystal structure. We have, lot of, uh, we have a database for that where the crystal structure of known proteins are deposited and this knowledge can be used of, by other tools to derive the function of an unknown sequence as well where they do some modeling studies. The other way is if you don't have a structure, you can still know the function by doing functional annotation where you're again aligning sequences, trying to look for sequence orthologs. So orthologs is meaning to say that there is a similarity, but that similarity is due to some speciation event and which means that the functional the function of that protein would still remain the same, though it has diverged. Then we look at conserved domains. So conserved domains are regions of the protein which are conserved during evolution, and they have some uh, importance in terms of function. Motifs are again a particular pattern of a sequence, protein sequence in some regions, which have important functions. And we also try to annotate sequences to different uh, by using the knowledge uh, data banks which we have for the pathways and the interactions and see if we can assign some hypothetical functions to the sequence. And all this is done computationally on the computer. Nothing is on the workbench, but these can be validated later uh, in the experimental workbench. So moving on to substitution matrices, which I have described, shown earlier, uh, it is seen that, uh, it is known that the protein to protein alignments are always better compared to nucleotide comparisons at the DNA level. The reason is, here is a codon table. If you consider you, uh, this particular uh, four codons for serine, and suppose I am aligning this DNA with this part of the DNA, there is a mismatch here. So my DNA alignment method would, uh, I mean, give a mismatch uh, score, which would be negative. But if you think the other way around, at the level of the protein, this is not a major change because it's still coding for the same amino acid. Hence, uh, due to this, the protein-to-protein -protein alignments are supposed to be more better in order to understand the functional similarities between two sequences. There are a couple of standard matrices, the scoring tables, which are used, and all of them have their own uh, way of uh, calculations. Uh, for example, PAM is based on the evolutionary aspect and blossom is actually better for more divergent sequences. But most of the uh, substitutions which happen in the proteins are conservative, meaning to say the amino acid remains the same or it is 
it belongs to the same group, meaning to say we have aliphatic amino acid, basic amino acids. So the, the charge of the amino acid is the same, and hence the functionally, they might not make any difference. But there could be some changes which could lead to mutations that might either get fixed in the species or that they might result in a disease. And for understanding, uh, for aligning these sequences, as I said, uh, we have scoring matrices, and these are derived from the standard protein databases. Um, and uh, uh, the reason why I give this introduction here is because the next time I'm going to talk a, a bit on the research I have done during my PhD on substitution matrices. Uh, where my question was on plasmodium falciparum. As you all know, this is a parasite which causes malaria and it is a very uh, prevalent infectious disease. Um, and plasmodium falciparum is one of the uh, species which causes a very severe form of malaria. Around the time when I joined my PhD, this genome got sequenced and people were very excited because plasmodium research was not really uh, uh, easy during um, when you think about uh, the bench work because firstly because the parasite has a very complex life cycle. Uh, partly it is in the mosquito, partly it is in the human and even in the human it has different stages in different uh, organs like the liver and the blood so it's very difficult to culture the pair and understand the biology of this parasite but once the genome was sequenced people were very hopeful that now we can match with some of the uh, do some computational analysis and try to find out some of the functions of the unknown proteins but the problem arised uh, when people started looking at them they could hardly assign any function uh, to any of most of the hypothetical proteins. Uh, the reason was the very highly biased genome, meaning to say the A and the T composition of the DNA was very high, it was around 80%. And experimental work showed that some proteins which they were looking at the sequence level and they seemed to be missing were otherwise present and were detected in the parasite. So that kind of um, guaranteed the problem that the AT bias is driving uh, this failure of protein sequence searches. So my research question was, what, what can I do to improve the sequence search? And if the genome is AT bias, is there also any change in the amino acid composition of the proteins? So, firstly, I uh, can I interrupt? Yes. Uh, Uma? Can yes. I interrupt, Uma? Uh, the voice is voice is low. Can you please? Uh, the voice is low. Uh, some of the participants are saying the voice is low. Can you please uh, look into this aspect? Yeah, can you can increase you the volume? Uh, is it loud? Yes. 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 Can it be more? Or you can put your uh, uh, microphone nearer to your so, when you speak. So this is a desktop and uh, I think it should be better now because I increase the volume. Okay, 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 okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, carry on. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, carry on. Uh, so initially, uh, what I did was to compare uh, two different organisms. One is the mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes um, uh, TB. Uh, this genome is not AT rich. It's like 34% AT. Um, and then for the proteins, the set of proteins which were common in both these uh, organisms, I looked at the amino acid composition. For all these, we need to write programs, computer programs, which can work on the sequences. 
and tell you how many, what is the frequency of every amino acid in the protein data set that I provided. So as you can see that some of the amino acids were overrepresented in the plasmodium. And the next question was to see if this is due to the effect of the nucleotide bias. Um, so the other uh, little task which I did was to compare for every amino acid, what is the nucleotide choice? So if you see here, for every other amino acid, naturally, you are seeing more of A and T. We would expect that because it is 80% AT rich, and that's what is confirmed here too. So it is choosing the codon which is more AT rich for that same amino acid. The next question was, is it driving the amino acid substitutions? Because here we saw for the same amino acid, it chooses a codon which is more AT, but then is it also changing the amino acids as we see over here? So this plot tells you the, the y-axis is the composition of only F, Y, M, I, N, K amino acids which were higher in composition in plasmodium. And the x-axis shows you the AT rich codons with respect to the first and second position of the codon. Why first and second? I mean, uh, it was compared against all the third position, first and second, and all codon positions. The reason is we decide if an amino acid can change. The third position is mostly gives the same amino acid. So if you see here, we get a good correlation and then the slope is very high in this case compared to the y the rest too which is telling you that this composition is of course responding to the first and second codon position at richness from here now the idea was to develop a method a workflow which would help me find or calculate a substitution matrix which will work best with the plasmodium. So I will not get into the details of the workflow, but all that I wanted to say is, literature searches clearly indicated that plasmodium had some similarity with plant as well. The reason was, uh, and also some of the archaebacteria, and the reason is its evolution, and so, whatever uh, organisms seem to have some relationship in terms of some proteins were selected and only the annotated ones, proteins were taken from all phyla and then this data set was used to calculate the substitution matrix. The idea was this will re best represent the substitutions and they should work well with the alignments. So this is a representation of a matrix which is standardly used and the matrix which I calculated. The, all the odd rows are uh, the standard matrices. If we look at the first one and first and the second row, uh, this one is a standard matrix, A substituted with different amino acids. The second row is again A substituted with different amino acids which comes from the matrix which I made. As you can see there is a lot of difference here in terms of what it is preferring from the protein data set which I use for the calculation. The color coding here is done based on the property of the amino acids and there seems to be a difference there. Now I see this difference but Does that help me in the alignments? So yes, it did. Um, I will, uh, so what it was doing is it helped me improve the alignment score. And also for uh, pairwise alignments of a known protein and an unknown plasmodium protein, I got more biologically meaningful alignments. For example, over here, this first protein sequence is from yeast, which uh, is a bifunctional enzyme, and it has two uh, motifs of the 
two enzymes of the shikimate kinase pathway. Uh, shikimate kinase pathway is an uh, attractive drug target for plasmodium because this uh, because this can be uh, exclusively targeted towards uh, the parasite as its uh, human counterpart is not there. And this is a hypothetical protein for which I from computational analysis, I could uh, identify the motive regions for these two enzymes with some amount of moderate uh, shorty. Uh, but then when I used the standard matrices, which I haven't shown here, there was a misalignment in these regions. But using my matrix, which I developed, I could align them more or less, which was very interesting. I further went ahead and uh, did database searches where you use all the hypothetical proteins of the plasmodium and do a search against the known proteins and see if you get some matches so that functionally you can annotate them. Sorry, I need to drink a little water. It's morning for me and I'm going dry. So um, there were some of the enzymes uh, which were uh, reportedly missing in plasmodium because they did not find any matches at the sequence level. But using these matrices, um, I was able to assign functions for those missing enzymes for some genes in plasmodium, which was interesting. Where do we go from here? Definitely experimental validation is a requirement. Uh, to conclusively say anything, but this is what computational biologist uh, does. So we give you uh, some cases where we say, okay, this looks like this protein and you can go ahead and test it in the lab. Uh, but in the case, if it is just hypothetical, you have no clue where to start from. So that's kind of an advantage there. Uh, later, a bioinformatics story was developed, which was a web server where all the matrices developed for Plasmodium uh, could be selected from a tab here. And uh, you can select what organism you want to compare your hypothetical sequence and do bidirectional hits or pairwise alignments. So we do best bidirectional hits is like if you hit protein A with protein B, and if you reverse the hit, like the query and the subject is reversed, you still get the same protein, then it is more confident to say that they might be the same uh, good orthologs and have same function. So moving ahead from bioinformatics, so this was all mostly bioinformatics work, which I did. Moving ahead and talking a bit on data science, which is a related field, and this is a very uh, upcoming, uh, emerging uh, field currently. So this uses more of the computer science and IT and statistics, machine learning, and instead of biology and bioinformatics, it's domain knowledge. And this domain can be anything, a business domain or a clinical domain. So you need a knowledge of at least one domain uh, for data science. The best example uh, for a data science driven um, tool is the COVID dashboard, which every country has. And uh, this is an example from John Hopkins, uh, which is a real time uh, dashboard and data is pulled from WHO and CDC. Uh, and then there are data science driven tools where instead of for contract tracing, uh, which instead of doing manually, you can have an app which will be able to send text messages to close contacts of infected people. So moving ahead with genomics, uh, genomics is an application of bioinformatics. I say application because in genomics you used bioinformatics tools and then 
One additional component is the DNA sequencing. So what is genomics? It is studying the complete genome of the organism. In case of human, by genomics, you are looking at all the chromosomes plus the mitochondrial DNA and sequencing it to understand the order of the ATGC in the DNA. And why is this important? Uh, and, and yes, and it also involves approaches to assemble and analyze the structure and the function. So uh, usually uh, DNA, this is an example of the current method for DNA sequencing. Uh, this is no, they are, currently we call it next generation sequencing, which is faster than the earlier methods. Uh, for example, you have any tissue of your choice, which can be your sample, and you extract DNA from it, and you prepare library. So all this is a protocol followed in a molecular biology lab, and what they do is they have this library of this uh, uh, extracted DNA, which then goes to the sequencer. So what do they do? These, this DNA library goes into a flow cell, and each cell here has a fragment of the DNA. And then each DNA in this flow cell is then amplified to give thousands of copies of the DNA, and then they are sequenced. What comes out of here is just something like this, a text file, uh, where the first line has an at the rate symbol. These are standard formats which are followed. And then the second line is the actual sequence of the fragment. The third is again, uh, you can add some additional information there regarding the read. And the fourth is, uh, uh, is a coding and this coding explains the quality of the nucleotide which was sequenced. So why is sequencing important? It's important because it helps us to understand which part of the DNA has genes, what are the regulatory regions which can turn on genes, and, um, and also diseases can be explained by genetic variation which can be detected by sequencing. So there are many technologies which were used to sequence genomes. The earlier techniques were Sanger's and some other methods which were very early on techniques, but later as um, uh, the first human genome was sequenced, around that time hierarchical shotgun sequencing was used. Around the same time, Craig Venter, uh, actually this was from a private company, they parallelly sequenced human genome and they used a, a little different method compared to this, which was a public uh, um, effort. They used a whole genome shotgun sequencing technique. So what they do here, they take the complete genome and then they fragment it. Each fragment is sequenced. So as you know, there may be, there may be more than one molecule and as such, it's possible that some of the molecules are fragmented in a different form so that later you can find some overlap, overlapping fragments like this. These overlaps help to assemble them later into a single sequence. So this method was a bit faster than what was used for sequencing the first human genome. <coughs> and. Uh, what was done here is uh, they had an additional cloning step here where each fragment was cloned into a back vector and that clone was sequenced. So what was the... Ad yes? Hello. Yes. PPT is not uh, presenting. It is only in the presenting mode, but uh, PPT is not visible. Oh, okay. Uh, so I think I need to quit and come back again. For me, it is visible. I don't know. It's visible for us about. Yes, it is visible. Okay. It, it is visible. Maybe it's a problem with the other end. It is visible. If it is visible. Okay. So, 
I think I need to. Please carry on. Okay. So uh, the disadvantage of this method was uh, it was very time consuming because every a single fragment had to be put into a back clone vector and then sequenced. But at the same time, it was an advantage because uh, there were less chances of a long range misassemblies because you know that this particular fragment you put in this clone, so it cannot match somewhere else. Uh, so if, 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 uh, if you are aware, the first human genome sequence took about 13 years to sequence. It was a huge, uh, uh, ambitious project which costed like dollar one billion, and it took 13 years. Time and on, uh, the technologies improved, and what we use today is next generation sequencing. Every day there is a new change in the technology, and they're getting better and better. And... With the next generation sequencing, it actually revolutionized the genomics research and even the lab started sequencing genomes. The current latest trend is third generation sequencing, which uh, gives usually longer reads and the longer reads are useful because uh, large variations like structural variants where you see large deletions, etc. cannot be detected by methods which give smaller reads and third generation sequencing takes care of this. Secondly, there are a lot of advantages here. Um, it is less costly, faster, it needs very small amount of starting material and it has also come to a point where uh, sing, uh, you can do things at single molecule resolution like the nanopore technology where you let only one molecule pass through, and then it is sequenced. The other interesting thing is the SMRT, which is also a third generation sequencing, where in real time you can actually see the sequence, uh, the um, DNA fragment getting sequenced because they use some dyes, and visually you can actually see in real time. The genomics era, as I said, uh, once the human genome got sequenced, uh, it had built a lot of pressure on the scientists to develop methods and uh, improve the technology. So, because uh, there was a lot of vision with this project where they wanted to take this to health uh, care, and as such, uh, I mean, th this was like 1990 to 2003, and from here onwards, the genomics era started where people started using new technologies which were faster, and now in today's time, you can sequence one human genome in a day or so for just like $1,000. So what is a human reference genome? Uh, when the first sequence, uh, human genome was sequenced, they actually took uh, uh, genomes from a couple of samples and they put it together. There were some donor genomes. And what they did is because it wouldn't be fair to represent a genome of a one individual person as a reference, uh, they took a consensus and this, was, this is used even today as a human reference genome. So how is it useful? This is useful for comparing the other sample genomes that we sequence. So we always go back to the human reference genome and ask the question, do we see the same nucleotide at this particular location or we see a change? If it's a match, it's the same as reference. If it is not, it is a SNP, that is a, which is also, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. And why is this important? It is important because research has shown how a single SNP can uh, give you a very different phenotype. One interesting example is a blonde hair color, the golden hair color in Europeans. 
which is caused by just one single snip in a gene in the hair. Um, there are some terminologies which commonly we use in this field and I thought it's important that I explain them. Yes. Hello. Please carry on. Okay. So, uh, mutation. Uh, uh, mutation is again a base change, but it is very rare. So, if you see that particular change in less than 1% of the population, we call it a mutation. One example is um, if you compare the um, tissues, two different tissues from the same sample, one is the cancer tissue and the normal tissue of the same individual, uh, you might find some mutations, uh, some uh, changes in the, soma the cancer tissue and not in the normal. That's a mutation. Again, SNP. SNP is again a single nucleotide change. Um, this is uh, present in greater than 1% of the population, then we call it a polymorphism or a SNP. Variance is a common term used for a SNP or mutation or any change in the base. Common variance is uh, a base change which you see in greater than 5% of the population. So, I have used the word population a lot. What population are we talking about here? So, currently there are huge uh, genomic projects where they have sequenced more than 1,000 individuals and they have made a database for everybody to access. So when we say common, rare, we actually compare with these samples and see how many times do I see that particular change in that database. So there are the different uh, genome sequencing types and each type has its own significance. Uh, the most expensive is the whole genome sequencing because here you are basically sequencing the entire genomic material. And the other is whole exome sequencing where you are only sequencing the exomes and not the introns. Um, why we do WGS? We do that because if we think that there is some regulatory uh, influence for the disease in question, for example, cancer, we prefer WGS. And for other like Mendelian disorders, we prefer WES. Coming to GVAS, GVAS is again uh, another um, genome sequencing method where you are looking at the genome-wide genetic variance in a large set of samples. And we ask the question that if we see a variant or a SNP, is it, is it associated with a trait? And the risk loci are identified uh, for the data set. And uh, this is mostly used uh, for common diseases like diabetes. And uh, for example, what comes out of the analysis is a plot like this, which is known as a Manhattan plot. And the x-axis shows the chromosomes, and the y-axis shows the association. So the higher the association, the more is, is the variant. Uh, um, it's a risk variant, rather. So if you see here, the blue, that's the top variant, is the risk variant for the disease in question. This part has been taken from a study, GVA study of microcirculation where they had identified this variant as seen to be commonly present in most of the samples, uh, which uh, is associated with the constriction in the blood vessels. And thinking about clinical implications of these, there is a diagram which shows how, so the, the one in blue is molecular techniques used. It can be transcriptomics, whole genome sequencing. This part uh, needs uh, experimental workbench where you prepare libraries. And then once they are sequenced, there are different methods which come into play like the GWAS study 
or genomic variation study from WGS or WES. And this knowledge is helpful in clinical applications. For example, it helps us to detect mutations which are drug resistant and that information can be used in drug dis discovery. So here I show, and so there are a lot of clinical applications for genomics. Uh, we can understand cancer specific mutations. We can also detect um, uh, um, issues uh, with uh, in prenatal diagnosis uh, and testing. We can identify genetic factors which contribute to inherited diseases and also the diagnosis of single gene disorders and gene therapy. This has now paved way to personalized medicine, which I'll come later on. And these methods have helped us uh, undergo gene therapy for some of the diseases too. On the left, I have an example of a classical sickle cell anemia, where a single mutation in the beta globin gene results in a sickle shaped red blood cell, which leads to low oxygen carrying capacity and how genomic studies was helpful uh, can be used the information can be used to even combat it through gene therapy so the idea is to isolate the uh, stem cells from the uh, person affected person and correct the cells for the single mutation and transplant it back into the person. As such, whatever gene which would be uh, uh, produced um, later on because it's a stem cell would be the wild type gene which doesn't have the mutation and it can be corrected. <coughs> Apart from uh, genomics, uh, there are other omics approaches in data analysis. Uh, Genomics is at the level of DNA. Transcriptomics is at the level of RNA, the messenger RNA. And proteomics is at the level of the proteins, what are all proteins you see in a tissue. And this is metabolomics, where you are measuring different metabolites in the organism or a tissue. This part uh, is mostly unknown. And as you see, these are huge numbers here. We don't know what each transcript does. And it, these are very tissue specific too. The expression is different in different tissues and as per the condition. Proteomics and metabolomics are very useful. Uh, they are less in number and uh, they are very useful in understanding what's exactly going on. There are some environmental influences which can also be studied through proteomics and metabolomics. And here is an example from an article. This shows uh, apples grown in different environmental conditions. One was grown in low altitude and the other in high altitude. And when they did proteomic and metabolomic studies, they saw that the protein component in the peel of the apple, which causes its ripening, the, they are different for the apple, which was grown in the high altitude compared to that in the low altitude. And so were the metabolites. So this shows the environmental effect of uh, on, on, uh, on processes and phenotypes. Human genetic variation. This is an example of a double-stranded DNA. This is normal. Uh, when there is a change, the T has changed to A, and consequently, the other strand, there is a change to A for the proper base pairing. Why do we care about it? We already talked about it, uh, but what I want to mention here is uh, genetic differences among individuals lead to differences in the disease risk and they in turn affect the response to treatment. 
Variation is also useful in identifying genes that contribute to specific disease. <clears throat> so this is a typical study of genetic variation. <coughs> so one case is where you're comparing two groups. One is a case, which is a disease group. The other is control, which has no disease. And you take uh, DNA from all of them and sequence them, but we consider this as one group and this as one group and compare. Then we do family studies where uh, you can have the DNA from the mom, mom, dad, and the affected child and the unaffected child. And these studies help us to understand if any gene mutation has been inherited from the parents and what was the pattern of inheritance. The other is cancer genomics, where we are looking at uh, changes that you see in the normal tissue compared to the tumor tissue in the same individual. And uh, this step over here, once the sequence comes out of the sequencer, there's a lot of work which goes in here. We have as many as um, 4 million or 6 million variants per sample. So we really have to be very careful in removing artifacts, some false variants, and there's a lot of filtering which goes here. And then comes the VCF, a format in which the variant data is stored. Uh, you can annotate this VCF to give more, add more information to every variant in there. And then we analyze, prioritize based on the phenotype which we are studying or other things. So this is how a variant called format VCF looks like. This is a text file. This is a huge file. One VCF file can be in gigabytes. And this is the starting material which we use on a computer to study variation. And we answer all questions which I just presented in the previous slide. The first few lines which start with a hash symbol are mandatory header lines. And uh, all the tools which recognize this uh, file look for this header. So if the header is missing, it cannot process the file. So it's very important. Then from here, once the hash stops, all these are variants. So each line is one variant which tells you which chromosome, which position, what is the change. And then it also gives you the last few columns give you the sample genotypes. So if we have a family study that helps us to understand that if mom is a heterozygous, in, in mom if one copy is mutated and dad the other copy is mutated, and in the child, both copies are muted. It's a homozygous uh, variant, which is recessive. So the genotype information is useful for understanding inheritance. So for every variant line here, you can now add in other annotations. How we do that? We use public databases and try to add as much information as we can for this particular gene, for this variant. For example, if I add an annotation, it will now tell me, okay, this variant hits chromosome 1 at this position, and it is hitting gene A. Within gene A, it is hitting exon 1, and so on and so forth. So this is a pipeline which we use for variant uh, analysis. As I showed you earlier, the sequencer gives you an output, a four-line output for every read, which is known as a FASTQ file. And then these reads are used for mapping to the reference genome, which I mentioned earlier. These files, again, are very heavy. They, they are in gigabytes and terabytes if there are more samples. And we use specific tools to do this mapping. Once we do mapping, we call variants uh, to see how and where there is a change. And we use specific tools for that again. And uh, a point to note, these tools are also evolving with time. 
and each time a new tool comes up and it claims that it does a better job, we go and try it out and use it if it is good. So it's always evolving. The next is the annotations. As I said, for every line, I want to add additional information for that we again use specific tools. And then what we have is a uh, lot of information. I mean, uh, one file has, I mean, thousands of lines and we really don't know what to do with it. So this is where programming comes. And for every question I have, I have to program, write a separate script, uh, which is very tough and it is error prone. So. During my first postdoctoral research with Dr. Aaron Quinlan, I developed this software called Gemini, which handles it very beautifully. So this is an example how for every sequence you're adding information from different databases which are available on the public domain. And as I mentioned that it's a very complex problem and if you, and for every project to have a different question and yes uh, for every uh, problem you have a different question and then you need to code at every diff every point and that is very error prone also we handle a lot of different kinds of file formats and that also com increases the complexity so this is how this tool comes into rescue. So the input is a VCF file, which I explained earlier. And this is actually a relational database where all the information is stored as a table and you can query that table. For example, you can ask, you can put a simple script on the command line and ask, okay, I'm interested to see what variants I see in gene A, and it will list out all of them. And uh, we can also work with the genotypes of the samples and do some family-based studies where I ask the question, okay, if the genotype of the mom is heterozygous and the dad is heterozygous and the child is homozygous for the alternate allele, list me all that I see. We had built a lot of tools additional tools in this main tool which is helpful in doing different kinds of analysis so that this framework can be used for any disease study and answer different questions which we have for different projects this was a highly successful tool um, had received a lot of citations and it is part of the uh, University of Washington Mendelin Analysis Seattle Sick Pipeline, and it is a tool which was used in SpeedSick, which actually was developed to uh, do clinical uh, analysis of uh, genomes in, uh, which is very speedy because uh, all these processes are very. Uh, was, not slow, but it will take a couple of days. But the idea was how we can take this to clinic. So if you have a patient uh, in the clinic and we can sequence the patient sample, can we quickly look at the genome? So that was SpeedSec, which was published in Nature Methods that uses Gemini as well. Uh, the tool was very useful in uh, a project uh, which I worked on. This is uh, for understanding the genetics of extreme sensitivity to ionizing radiation. Here we used whole exome sequencing. And what is extreme sensitivity? So some people have are sensitive to radiation, the X-ray and the gamma radiation. And for cancer patients who are sensitive, they fail to receive the treatment, radiation therapy, and that's a huge issue. So some of the genes, it, it is known that the DNA, DNA damage response pathway um, genes are the ones which are affected for, for the radiation sensitive samples. But there are a few genes only which were uh, known to cause this. 
It is also known that this is a very rare and recessive disorder, meaning to say that the mom and the dad need to be, I mean, heterozygous. And uh, for a person to become homozygous, uh, for a person to have the disorder, he needs to be homozygous. So some of the phenotypes, uh, the major phenotype for this disease is ataxia. It's more developmental and neurological defects. And uh, what we, by doing whole exome sequencing of 96 patient samples, which were actually sent to testing for uh, two phenotypes, which are known for this specific disease. They were screened and the mutations were not seen in these two main genes. So this gave the opportunity to look for new genes, which uh, might not be discovered yet. So what did we see? So this is an example of uh, a gene, MTPAP, which I discovered in one of the samples. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, IGV, which is uh, for looking at the alignments once you have them. As you see, most of the reads have a uh, variant here. When most of the reads have variant, it is considered homozygous. And there was a publication uh, on this gene that uh, this gene is responsible or associated with ataxia, which is a main phenotype in our case as well. But it was not known that this gene can make you radiation sensitive. So what did it? Um, as you know, in India, mostly in South India, uh, there is a tradition of getting married in families, within the families in relation. And that is not very good in the sense genetically it will affect and it will result in uh, disorders uh, of where the there's no chance of the child to be homozygous for a mutation in the western world you do not see this but there is a specific group which where this is seen and this sample seemed to belong to that group so they went back to the family and got the DNA sequenced for the unaffected. These are the unaffected siblings and these are the affected. And they did some experimental studies. So what they show here is the clonogenic survival study where uh, they see that after radiation, do the cells survive and how much do they survive? So this is a wild type. That's the survival. And these unaffected almost have the same survival range. <coughs> but uh, the sample which had uh, this mutation in empty pap showed less survival. Uh, in this case, again, they did a percentage DNA repair uh, experiment known as a neutral comet length assay. And as you see, the DNA repair is less in the two samples which had the empty pap mutation and the wild type and the unaffected had more or less similar level of the DNA repair. Then what they did is uh, they tested if a wild type uh, empty pap protein could rescue the phenotype and this is where they added the wild type and it became similar to what the wild uh, type is for the survival. Here the same they did for the DNA repair and by adding the wild type to the affected there is an increase in the DNA repair as well. So the bioinformatic work workflow which I used for the discovery of this gene led me to look forward at other genes using the same protocol and we discovered one more gene, MCPH1. It was very interesting that there were mice, there, there, there was a publication on the mice study where it was shown to be hypersensitive to gamma radiation. And that was interesting because we have some proof now that this might be radiation sensitive. So the muta mutation was confirmed in the cell lines. 
and it showed that it failed to make the protein, so this was a loss of function mutation. This information was used in the clinic by the parents of this patient who underwent an embryo selection through in vitro fertilization for this mutation. Yet there was an, one more discovery of a gene uh, which could be used as a novel target for cancer cells. I will explain how. So during radiation therapy, some drugs are used which are radio sensitizers, meaning to say that the therapy will target the DNA of the cancer cells more than the normal cells. So ATIC was a gene which we identified in this study and it was mutated and it had no function and that led to, radi that led to radiation sensitivity. So the idea was to make inhibitors to this gene, to the wild type gene, so it can be used as a chemo radio sensitizer for targeting the cancer cells. So as you see here, these graphs are different colon cancer cell lines and one osteosarcoma cell line. Uh, this is the, the small molecule inhibitor for ATIC in different concentration. And there is a survival fraction comes down significantly when you add the inhibitor. So there are other examples of disease diseases studied using these methods. Most of them are still unpublished. Uh, one is uh, understanding the chemo resistance to ovarian cancer. So our university is associated with the hospital and we have cancer patient sa samples too. We have a cancer center. So we use those samples for doing sequencing and study them. Then we have the diabetes, where we did, we did a whole genome sequence analysis and a WGS uh, uh, and a GBAS uh, on the set of patients who were showing autoimmunity, because autoimmunity is to some extent said to be related to diabetes, which can further lead to diabetes down the road. Uh, there's something called targeted resequencing, where you sequence only some specific regions uh, for uh, SLE disease. Uh, we did that. Uh, this was a, in collaboration with a lab who works on this disease. And they did identify that a specific locus is associated with the disease. So we went ahead and did a targeted resequencing of this region to see what are the variants which we see in the samples. And then uh, currently I'm working on leukemia. Uh, we look at the patients which come into the clinic and uh, the idea is to see if like some patients do not respond to some of the drugs. So by doing whole genome sequencing and studying their genomes, we are trying to understand which group of patients are not responding to a specific therapy. Family-based studies, uh, this is an example of a clinic again. A patient comes in with some very rare disease. So this came for analysis. Um, so we had uh, the DNA sequence done for both the parents. And we had sequence from the diseased tissue and the normal tissue of the patient. And these are the kind of questions we could ask, uh, like the different inheritance patterns, and then uh, I also looked at the non-Mendelian uh, factors like the de novo mutation, which happens once uh, the zygote is formed. And uh, we found an interesting gene variant under this category, but none here. So the other omics is transcriptomics, uh, where, uh, which is also known as RNA sequencing, where you take samples of interest. Here I've shown an example where I take normal tissue and cancer tissue and uh, isolate the RNA. Uh, so once you isolate the RNA, you then amplify it and sequence it. And then similar to somewhat similar to the whole genome sequencing studies, we again map to a genome. We have a reference there and then we also mapped the transcriptome and the exon junctions and analyzed further. So 
we can do a differential expression analysis, which means that what are the genes which are expressed in the cancer tissue and not in the normal tissue is a kind of question we can ask, and that gives us some insights. This is an example of a transcriptomic study, which I did for a specific type of blood cancer. Uh, here, what I'm showing is um, uh, in my analysis, I saw that this pathway was uh, mostly perturbed in the cancer cells. So it was interesting to see what genes are being expressed. And the major question here was to understand relapse in the patients. Uh, what is relapse? Relapse is uh, once the patient is uh, diagnosed with cancer, they undergo a treatment. For some time, they are fine, and then they relapse back. The condition becomes worse, and the tumor grows back. So we had four to three relapse stages from the same sample. That means at different time points, the genome sequencing was done, or the transcriptomic data was obtained. And then we do a comparison. As you see here, this shows the ones in red are the genes which are overexpressed, and those in green are underexpressed compared to the normal tissue. Um, so comparison of the diagnosis stage and relapse one gave this set of genes which were overexpressed. There were some common genes in the relapse two as well. But as we moved to relapse four, there was only one gene which constantly overexpressed from diagnosis through relapse, which was interesting. And uh, where we go from here, uh, this can be uh, further experimented on in the experimental workbench to see what effect it does. This is another example of using transchromic transcriptomics data for understanding a pathway. Um, this is from the anesthesiology department where uh, they study, uh, they're trying to research on sepsis, which is commonly seen in emergency care. And uh, it is known, or uh, there is a, um, a group of research where they think that anesthesia may have some implications to recovery, the type of anesthesia used. And so we were interested in studying uh, the differ differential expression of genes under these two anesthetic conditions and how it affects the sepsis. This was carried out on rat models. And uh, this analysis was supported, uh, the results, whatever I got from RNA sequencing kind of supported the biochemical studies which were ongoing in the lab. And at the same time, it helped in uh, adding some missing links from this data and could explain the pathway better. So, to finally, I would like to talk a bit on personalized medicine with uh, how it can be used with genomics. Here is an example of colon cancer patients. So, cancer is very, uh, I mean, the cancer is very heterogeneous. It's not the same across all samples, though they have the same cancer. So, a common therapy might actually make a good effect on some, have no effect on others, and might even have adverse effects on some group of patients. The knowledge of genomics, where we use different omics uh, data analysis drawn from the normal and the disease tissues, helps us to categorize these patients into different groups and see which therapy would work better for which group. So this is known as personalized medicine. Uh, where you give an individualized treatment to the patient from the genomic knowledge which we gain. Conclusions, uh, so I hope I uh, could convince you enough that genomic applications are very useful. Um, they, are, they have a tremendous potential in healthcare. And currently, genomics and data science are the training fields in the scientific community. And plant research is also benefited from genomic studies because selection of species to increase the produce and overcome the adverse climatic conditions uh, 
these kind of research can be done by doing genomic studies. Lastly, I want to conclude with some latest interesting developments in the genomics field uh, during this year or year or so. One great achievement was the NASA identical twin study where uh, two twins were chosen, a, a twin uh, was, uh, identical twins were chosen for this study where one of the twin was on Earth and the other twin was sent to NASA in space. And they did all kinds of omics analysis on uh, these two samples and they found differences. So why identical twins? Because the genetic background is similar in identical twins and it helps us to understand, understand the envir environmental effect uh, more in a more better way as the individual differences are not seen. So what they discovered is the telomere length which telomere is a region which is present at the end of the chromosomes and that is important for aging uh, as the length decreases we age so they found that the twin who was sent to the space there was differences in the telomere length during space flight there were differences in the gene expression and also the epigenomic changes seen in the twin who went to space and the metabolomic studies revealed uh, signs of atherosclerosis um, in the twin who went to space. And the proteomics revealed vision issues which the twin experienced in space and they could attribute it to a protein called AQP2. Uh, in uh, the plant research, uh, genetic diversity of grapes was found to be due to just one single mutation which defined the white and the red grape varieties. Researchers also use CRISPR technology, this is a technology for genome editing, uh, to correct the mutation of muscular dystrophy model of mice and uh, semi-identical twins. We know identical twins and non-identical twins. There was a semi-identical twin which was identified in womb through genetic testing. And uh, there was a research where they found out that the doctor's DNA who are in residency who work for, uh, depending on how many hours of work they do, they age six times faster than the normal, which is interesting. And a blind mice regained sight after a single gene was inserted. So as we see that genomics has a lot of potential, it's a very interesting science and uh, it is very useful in healthcare. With this, I thank you for your attention and would take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ma. That was a very elaborate explanation and uh, introducing us to the world of uh, genomics and bioinformatics. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, this was a very useful session. Mostly uh, the last part was very interesting about the twin study, one in, in uh, Earth and one in the space. And um, I would like to ask the participants, if any one of you have any questions, please uh, go forward with the questions. We might take one or two questions at this moment. So if anyone has questions. Uh, Bani and Uma, I will make a suggestion here. Sir. Are, are you hearing me? Yes, uh, sir. Uh, Bani, your, your talk was really brilliant. And, and the way you made the presentation, it was, it was so students should have enjoyed the talk very much. And as a very senior teacher, I can understand how good you are as a, uh, as a presenter and so as much, a teacher, right? Now, I have a suggestion to make. So this is, today's team is, theme is animal ethics and uh, genomics, right? So yes. if you would make a link between these two two titles, like, uh, I, I can do that, but I would like you to do that. Uh, link uh, genomics, talk about link genomics a little bit in two, three sentences with so animal I ethics. About, I, yeah, I can talk yeah. about it right now. So um, the main reason why a lot of mice studies or rat studies have been conducted till now was because we had the rat genome sequenced and it was very well annotated. And we already had information about a lot of proteins and we knew that the mice genome is comparable to the human. So whatever studies we do in mice can be uh, uh, reproduce, are reproducible or the effects are similar in human. 
but the current studies do not say so because uh, the current studies say that many of the rat studies and the conclusions drawn from the rat studies are not reciprocating in human. So that's one good reason why you want to uh, switch over to genomic studies in other organisms than rat, so you don't sacrifice them. As uh, an earlier presentation was given, C. elegans, zebrafish, they are very good models for studying for human-related stuff. And uh, also, uh, I feel that once with the genome sequencing technologies, uh, you have the entire knowledge in one go. And whatever project you want to study, you can go back to that data and question. But if you're working with rats, every other person has a different question and they're sacrificing like hundreds of rats for that specific study. But I feel that with this technology, uh, once you have sequenced and you have the data, that data can be reanalyzed in a different angle for every project. Um, that's what I would say. A little more beyond what you have said, uh, 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 Hema. Um, like, like if, if, if you are, somebody has uh, yes, uh, about 100 compounds to test for uh, risk or toxicity, they use 100 rats for each compound. So, if you would, they would choose to go for bioinformatics tools like prediction uh, approaches, then they can do matching as to how best these are. Yeah. Uh, bioinformatics as an alternative to animal experimentation. Yeah, and definitely. If, yeah, right. Yeah, definitely. Because as I give an example where you have an entire genome and uh, you, you can you can't just take one protein which you don't know any information about. If you do some early analysis that will bring down the list of uh, genes you want to work with, and then you can go on from there. Yeah. Definitely agreed. Good. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Nice career. So, I'm uh, Dr. Satyanarayana from Chennai. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent presentation. I am also a retired teacher. The way in which your presentation is very, very enlightened, very clear, especially bioinformatics. So here we, we find it very difficult to teach bioinformatics. That is why it is winning in, in India, for example, because we don't have the uh, good teachers to explain the well. Anyway, so what, what is the actual opinion because uh, the bioinformatics uh, acceptable for uh, any validation? Uh, you said, for example, sequence alignment. Sequence alignment. So what is the value? When the question of validation comes, are you satisfied with the 50% level, 70% or 100%? Can I put a validation? Yeah, so so I would like to make two comments here. Um, your first question was, uh, uh, can you please no, repeat the, the first question? Yeah. No, I, I, okay. The sequence alignment of your uh, result validation. Or whether it will be 100% level or 50% okay. content okay. level. Uh, yeah, so, so sequence alignments, it depends. So uh, when you do sequence alignments, there is a cutoff which we use. We cannot just go with anything. So you can be very stringent at that point as to what you are believing and trusting. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing, always in computational biology, validation is a very important aspect and they need to be validated to say anything. That's not the end. So they need to be validated for sure. Uh, but at the level of bioinformatics, we can always filter out. As I mentioned in genomics, we have like millions of variants and we end up with a couple of them because that's due to the extensive filtering which we apply. So yeah, that's what I would say that it is not 100%. You have to be very stringent in what you believe, and then you should validate. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, do you any want other, me? Do any you other through the questions in the chat? Yes, one or two. Uh, we can quickly have. 
Have we tried gene insertion among humans to check blindness? This is someone who has written. Uh, I don't think so because I think this was the latest article which was in mice. Uh, so I don't think so. Or, I mean, uh, I don't know, I should say, because uh, research is a field uh, we go ahead and look for uh, things which uh, are related to the work we do, so I might not be updated. But uh, the mice study is recent, so I would say that in humans it's not done yet. Okay, can we come? This is the end of the third technical session. Uh, thank you so much for uh, such an elaborate explanation. I hope um, all the participants have benefited from this uh, uh, much valuable talk on bioinformatics. And I request uh, Principal Sir Arko Valley uh, wants to speak. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, all of you. Good evening, all of you, ma'am. Am I audible? Good evening, sir. Yes, sir, you are audible, sir. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, sir. I request to say something regarding uh, the webinar. Please, sir. That Ms. Krishna College Principal, sir. Please tell something regarding the webinar, conduct of webinar and resource persons sir, password. More number of participated in this webinar. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, I would like to yes, congratulate uh, Principal Arguvali, Dr. Chandramoli Garu, and uh, your uh, team, Samuel David Raj, Yar Vani, and other uh, lecturers. Uh, it, it is an excellent uh, opportunity for uh, all the Dwalji faculty in India, maybe uh, and abroad. So, uh, I think it is a wonderful and a useful uh, webinar. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, all uh, Dwalji faculty will also understand the uh, animal uh, uh, dissections and uh, digital uh, methods of uh, practical uh, methods. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, I think uh, uh, digital methods uh, may be uh, useful for uh, the practical uh, also. So, uh, it is, uh, I think it is a wonderful webinar and uh, I congratulate all the uh, organizers and um, uh, I also thank uh, resource persons also. Thank you, sir. So, thank you very much, sir. Because your cooperation is most uh, valuable, sir. Because we have no 2B and 2FA. For the benefit of participants, uh, we take permission from your side because you are the DRC, District Resource Center. So anything, I am very thankful to sir for cooperation of uh, the conduct of uh, webinar. And at the same you, time, your, and at the same time, your geology department also participation is more important because uh, Vani Madam is a very nice uh, way of conducting of this uh, webinar. So I am very thankful to all the resource persons and participants and organization committee and everybody thankful to sir thank you so much sir thank you thank you thank you for this great opportunity uh, now i uh, request uh, vice principal of uh, arupu college uh, to kindly come forward with the closing remarks and i request all the participants kindly stay back for the closing uh, remarks uh, I want to say thanks to all the participants for for the patient hearing and making this webinar a very grand success. Please stay back for the closing remarks. Fill up in the form. And over to uh, Vice Principal, Government Degree College, Alpo Valley, Dr. Padma Lata Madam Gar. Over to you, Madam. Dr. Degree is good evening on behalf of the our coordinating committee for this international webinar, Government Degree College, Arku Valley, Vishapatna District. I am speaking with K. Padmalata. She is an immense pleasure to propose the vote of thanks for the event who spread their valuable time for, for the benefit of student community. First and foremost, I would like to thank our chief partner, 
So, Yamam Nayak IAS, Commissioner of College of Education, Government of Andhra Pradesh, Vijayawada, who inspired us to start this international webinar. I would like to convey my sincere thanks to our partner, Dr. G. Chandramoli, sir, Principal Government Degree College, Earth Valley, who always starts on the back with intensive thoughts and ideas. And I would like to thank our co-partner, Dr. V. Chandrasekhar, sir, Principal Dr. V. S. Krishna College, Vishaw Patna, and with their collaboration and cooperation, we succeeded to reach our goal. And my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to, the, to our research person, uh, Dr. N. A. Akbar Shah, sir, Biomedical Scientist and Research Coordinator, National College, Tirchirapalli, uh, India. And he profoundly says that animal, about animal protection laws. He fought for 30, 30 years and the prevention of unethical animal experimentation uh, regarding, regarding animal safety. It is thought provoking and he initiates that the role of humans towards animals. And I, I would like to thank Dr. M. S. Sajinanda, sir, Assistant Professor Retired, Department of Wildlife Biology and Geology, Mailadatur, uh, India. And he, in, in, he initiates the legal protection of animals and how CP, CPCA guidelines should be followed strictly by, uh, by the clinical, uh, for the clinical, clinical studies. And also, uh, he has given ethical issues by using anesthesia for live, uh, live animals in medical experimentation. And he also says that as if, uh, we have to minimize the animals used for the experimentation that will have, and we have to look after them up by rehabilitation. And I would like to thank Dr. P. Uma Devi, research inspector, University of Virginia, Virginia University, and she has uh, clearly studies about, states about genomic genetics variation and she profoundly talks about genomic study and the, the genomic studies will help the potential health and risk management and also it helps the, the study will, will help the recognize the inheritance diseases like diabetes and even in the cancer also uh, this tissue mutation will help the study will help to identify the tissue mutation. And my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to the organizing secretary, Dr. T. Samuel David Rao, the assistant professor, geology, GDC, ARCO, and the convener, Dr. P. R. Rani, assistant professor, geology, Dr. V. S. Krishna College, Vishal Patna, and the co convener, Dr. Pavda, sir, ITSC coordinator, GDC, ARCO. And Dr. C. H. Lalita, ITSC coordinator, Dr. V. S. Krishna College, Vishal Patnam, for taking pains to make this program grand success. Finally, I thank our coordinator, Srimad K. Padmulata, assistant professor in English, JDC, Arku Valley, Dr. T. and Rasul, sir, assistant professor in Telugu, JDC, Arku, and Sri D. Ramesh, sir, assistant professor in Commerce, JDC, Arku. And I thank uh, Sri K. Vidya Sagar sir, Assistant Professor in Mathematics, GDC, Marisalam, and P. Praveen Kumar and A. V. Ramana, GDC, Arku Valley, for their technical support. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the student community who choose to be with us in this international web seminar with great enthusiasm. Once again, I will thank one and all and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, madam. Thanks. Thank, thank you for giving the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, sir. I have a small announcement for all the participants. Uh, we have provided you the feedback form. In that feedback form, will be have the original feedback form uh, certificate. The, feed, the feedback form will be leading to a giving will be giving you a certificate. But actually, the original certificate that are that is going to be submitted to UGC will be having a barcode with all the participant list. So, only those that have participated are, will, be, will be in the barcode list. So, please do not share this uh, feedback link with others. 
even though they get the certificate it will, will not be valid so only those that have registered and participated uh, have to fill the feedback form thank you very much and i thank uh, dr g chandramouli garu principal government degree college arku and uh, dr v chandrasekhar garu uh, principal dr v s krishna college arku all the staff members of uh, uh, both the colleges and uh, convener dr p r wani madam and uh, none other than um, my dear sir akbar shah garu and uh, uh, sachinana sir and uma madam for uh, their valuable information that is provided to the participants and most of the participants are asking about the ppts uh, if uh, you uh, give permission i will share the ppts to the to their respective email id sir uh, uh, i will get back to you as soon as uh, possible thank you thank you one and of one and all with this uh, the program closes anything to be said from resource persons or uh, chandramouli sir or chandrasekhar sir please respond our participants uh, any, any participant can unmute and give their valuable feedback on these three sessions before closing the session thank you uh, sir uh, on behalf of uh, dr v s krishna college uh, uh, i invite uh, dr lalita to speak uh, something thank you very much sir for giving this opportunity i take the privilege of uh, proposing the uh, thank thanks and uh, congratulating our uh, dear ones colleagues uh, dr t samuel david rajgaru and uh, dr pr wani madam for uh, taking the initiative uh, in planning and conducting this uh, uh, international webinar uh, uh, i know that it is uh, Uh, very painful during this kind of situation that is a covid pandemic but uh, in spite of that they have taken all the technical pain and arranged this and have been <laughs> arranged this for the past 5 uh, 5 6 days i think uh, i know very well uh, because dr p r wani shared uh, all the uh, technical problems with me um, so uh, Uh, in spite of that they have uh, succeeded in conducting this uh, um, the international webinar and uh, making it a grand success and uh, i also um, take the uh, privilege of uh, proposing uh, congratulations and thanks to uh, dr g chandramouli sir principal of arku valley uh, gdc arku valley and padmalata madam vice principal of uh, arku valley and k prabhas garu ikc coordinator uh, gdc arku valley for uh, uh, taking initiative uh, in conducting this uh, kind of uh, such a uh, highly informative webinar and uh, uh, last but not least uh, i would like to uh, congratulate and thank our uh, uh honorable lord principal sir uh, dr v chandrasekhar sir um, uh, in uh, conducting this webinar even though it is mutual this kind of uh, interdisciplinary uh, webinars are also very much useful because it's, since it's a subject related uh, um, i think most of the geology and uh, life sciences faculty have been uh, uh, benefited much by, by this and uh, the uh, I, I, due to uh, the conduct of uh, uh, drc meetings simultaneously we could not uh, listen to the uh, middle uh, mid session uh, because of the, both the principals and the myself uh, were in particip participation of the uh, drc meeting uh, so i request uh, our uh, organizers to kindly share the link to me uh, so that uh, i could listen to the uh, missed sessions and uh, uh, finally Uh, on behalf of uh, dr vs krishna college i would like to uh, congratulate the organizers and the team uh, in taking the pain of uh, conducting this webinar thank you very much for giving this opportunity thank you dr thank you. samuel thank you very much thank thank you very thank you sir chandramouli sir em matladtara okay sir thank you to all Uh, our IQC coordinator speak something regarding uh, for conduct of webinar. Did he say Arku? Arku yes, Rasgar.
Hello. Sir, sir you are audible. Please speak. Hello. You are audible, sir. Please, please speak. Hello. Sir, you are audible. Please speak. ప్రభుదాస్ గారు వినపడుతుంది మాట్లాడండి మాట్లాడండి హ్యూమన్ biology and like that the sequencing and everything is uh, very uh, helpful to us and i just want to learn so much from this section and thank you so much for the opportunity you have given to me thank you thank you thank you thank you sir anybody else otherwise we'll close the session so thank you participants thank you chandramouli garu chandrashekar garu all the organizing committee members ratna bharti madam vijay sagar garu pravdas pravdas garu ramesh garu uh, parmalata garu and all the supporting staff including praveen from uh, gdc arku who gave technical support day in and day out uh, and all the participants uh, for staying back till the end uh, i am very much thankful sure. thank you sir that's such a point very very i am once again thankful to vich sagar technical support i am very thankful to support for this uh, technical session and everything on behalf of our college okay thank you sir one more thing uh, along with sagar sunil sunil sir for computer lecturer from uh, government arts college rajmohan okay, also okay. gave uh, gave his uh, technical support to us i am thankful okay, to both sir. of them sir thank you very much thank you sir we, have to, we we can close the session now okay sir carry on okay okay close the session okay. thank you sir 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 we are closing the session okay sir i'm closing the Bye. session thank you thank you one and all